Next on C-SPAN, the House Telecommunications Subcommittee holds a hearing on the regulation of telephone rates. The hearing is chaired by Congressman Ed Markey, a Democrat of Massachusetts, and among those testifying before the subcommittee, the chairman and members of the Federal Communications Commission. Before the hearing started, we spoke to Congressman Mickey Leland about the purpose of the hearing. The purpose is to try to get some understanding about what the FCC wants to do about uh, the so-called price cap plan of, uh, of action uh, imposed uh, by them as a policy to determine exactly what, exa uh, what uh, impact it will have, the so-called price cap policy, would have on consumers. Uh, we're not convinced in Congress that that is the best possible way. The Chairman Patrick has, uh, will indicate, I'm sure, that, uh, that uh, the price cap is the best possible uh, options that we have available to us to uh, allow for the so-called free enterprise system uh, to work its will, particularly as it relates to AT&T. We're very concerned about how that, however, uh, challenges the, the very essence of our regulatory uh, oversight that we have in hoping that uh, prices will remain at least uh, affordable by the consumer. Where is the motivation for implementing the price cap plan coming from, and why now? Well, it certainly comes from the White House. It's emanating from the White House, and Chairman Patrick is obviously their surrogate, uh, being in the position that he's in. We don't know why it all of a sudden has come up, which is why we want to slow him down uh, so that we can make uh, certain determinations. It's a very good strategic time to do it, however, because Congress is going out of session. If, in fact, they were to move swiftly on this matter, then uh, we would have uh, have to wait until next year to uh, look at uh, some uh, legislation that would uh, possibly impose some limited regulations on what the FCC can or cannot do in this matter. We, we then asked FCC Chairman Dennis Patrick about the so-called price cap approach, which the FCC is proposing to the subcommittee. The price cap proposal is a notice of proposed rulemaking by the Commission in which we are exploring the possibility of replacing rate of return regulation of dominant carriers, that would be AT&T and the local exchange carriers, with a system wherein we regulate the price directly, a price cap. Why is the administration pushing this idea now? Is there any significance to the timing? I don't know that there's any particular significance to the timing per se, other than the fact that we have realized that rate of return regulation uh, includes a number of perverse incentives and does not cause uh, carriers, uh, as far as we're concerned, to economize, uh, to avoid cross-subsidies, uh, to do everything they can to lower the price of services uh, to consumers. So what we're exploring is uh, a, a different approach to regulating uh, the market power or controlling the market power of dominant carriers that would give those carriers a more proper incentive structure with respect to economizing, cutting costs, avoiding uh, cross-subsidies, because we think, of course, that that would uh, be more beneficial to consumers. And finally, Congressman Jack Fields of Texas told us what he thinks of the FCC's price cap idea. I think it's something that we need to explore because it does appear that it could save consumers in America a great deal of money. And I applaud Chairman Patrick for bringing this issue to our committee and studying the issue in great detail. Now, you will be questioning Chairman Patrick uh, some ways into the hearing, which we'll be watching in a couple of minutes. What, what will be your line of questioning? Well, I want to know why he wants to apply the price cap to AT&T and not to the local exchange companies, because he basically says that uh, if a price cap is applied to AT&T, that there will be an incentive to save money and that those savings can be passed on to consumers. Well, my question is, if it uh, is good for AT&T, why, why isn't it good also for the local exchange company so that the consumer can get a uh, double-edged benefit? And uh, hopefully I'll find out the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Now we take you to the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. The topic, regulating telephone rates. Good morning. This is a, uh, a hearing of the uh, Telecommunications and Finance uh, Subcommittee um, for various and sundry uh, reasons. Uh, several members are slightly delayed in their arrival at this time. and. Uh, uh, we will allow them to be recognized uh, when they arrive, but I just think in the interest of ensuring that this hearing is uh, finished in a uh, timely uh, fashion and, uh, um, uh, and the 
that uh, all members and all witnesses are given plenty of time in order to uh, <coughs> deal with the important issues in front of us that will commence the hearing at this time. Today we will examine two controversial and sweeping FCC initiatives. Each is a dramatic departure from the way the FCC traditionally regulates. Each will directly and significantly affect the price and quality of our telephone service. First, we will review the FCC program to control cross-subsidies between telephone companies, regulated and unregulated services. Without adequate controls, phone companies uh, would have the opportunity to uh, harm consumers and drive competitors out of business. Under the soon-to-be implemented plan, the FCC <coughs> will abandon its existing safeguards, <coughs> which require phone companies to provide their unregulated services under separate companies or subsidiaries and replace these protections with untested accounting and cost allocation procedures that have private CPA firms <coughs> certify phone companies' compliance. In a report released last week, the GAO concluded that this FCC plan to lessen restrictions, quote, may paradoxically require a greater degree of FCC oversight. The report concludes that this oversight cannot be done effectively at present FCC staffing and funding levels. Even the Reagan administration's Justice Department agrees. Let me quote, at present, <coughs> the Commission does not have sufficient number of auditors to take on the increased responsibilities resulting from this proceeding. The failure to devote sufficient resources to the audit process will reduce any prophylactic program, no matter how sound in theory a principle, to a sham that deceives rather than protects ratepayers and state regulators. In fact, the GAO states <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. That this may only be able that this FCC may only be able to perform an audit of phone company activities in a given area once every 16 years. We might as well hand over our regulatory oversight to a bunch of cicadas. True, they only come around <laughs> once every 17 years, but there are a lot more of them, and they make more noise than these FCC auditors have over the past several years. Today, we will also examine the FCC proposal to eliminate rate of return, or cost of service regulation, in favor of a new concept, price cap. Under the price cap theory, the FCC would set a price ceiling or limit and abandon regulation based on phone companies' costs and profits. The specifics of the plan are not yet fully developed. But in phone circles, this plan is drawing as much attention as the personal lives of Supreme Court justice nominees. Chairman Patrick has called the price cap model, quote, the first major overhaul of rate regulation in a quarter of a century. <coughs> but it raises fundamental questions of whether this type of regulatory restructuring, restructuring is appropriate at this time. The FCC has not provided empirical evidence detailing the shortcomings of rate of return regulation or specified the advantage of the price cap model. <coughs> Today, we provide Chairman Patrick uh, and the FCC an opportunity to make their case to the American people. In light of the fact that under the existing regulation, the United States has developed the best telecommunications system in the world, and the cost of telephone service has declined by 60% in real dollars, the first task is to justify the reasons for implementing this untested proposal at this time of uncertainty <coughs> and transition in the telecommunications marketplace. Further, we, we must be assured that consumers will realize the benefits of lower phone prices and that our high-quality service will remain intact. I have consistently advocated the need for forward-looking policies, but jettisoning, jettisoning proven programs for untested concepts 
is not my idea of a forward-looking policy. We do not have to look far into our past to recollect how appealing and forward-looking airline deregulation seemed just a few years ago. Today we expect the FCC to respond to these fundamental questions. Before they go forward with implementing these new programs, they must demonstrate their commitment and ability to protect consumers and competitors from the dangers of phone company cross-subsidization and monopoly pricing. Both of these plans <coughs> follow in a long line of similar initiatives this FCC has promoted in the name of efficiency and consumer interests, such as the elimination of a children's television guidelines, the repeal of anti-trafficking of station licensing rules, the approval of customized pricing plans, and the imposition of a $3.5 billion per year uh, in subscriber line charges. Both these plans test this FCC's commitment to carry out its mandate to promote the public interest. Both plans, the FCC claims, are in the consumer interest, yet both are rejected by consumer representatives. Both plans espouse the Chicago School of Economics theory about efficiency and free market incentives, uh, but both exist in a distorted monopoly and pseudo-monopoly environment far from a free and competitive marketplace. So our objective here today is to, in fact, begin the process of fleshing out exactly how these proposals will, in fact, uh, be implemented in a way which will ensure that there is, in fact, uh, full protection for consumers, full protection against cross-subsidization for uh, competitors. And, um, uh, and we look forward to what I believe is going to be a very uh, important hearing, and I think that the interest which is shown in the number of people who have uh, come here today uh, demonstrates uh, how important this issue is. Um, I want to apologize in advance for the uh, condition of my throat and the number of times which I will uh, cough. I uh, unfortunately have uh, contracted whatever it is, what is which is uh, spreading throughout this uh, city over the last couple of weeks. And, <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, I, uh, and I apologize in advance. So I, I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I certainly want to welcome Chairman Patrick and the members of the Commission and also, uh, I don't know whether to congratulate or sympathize with Commissioner Dawson, whose last hearing this is, because next week she will be undergoing confirmation <coughs> hearings as Deputy Secretary of Transportation. And I certainly want to say that I've enjoyed working with you, and uh, I'm sure we all wish you well in your new assignment, and I'm uh, certain that you'll do your very, very best in the same dedicated and <coughs> exemplary fashion that you's, you've exhibited at the FCC. I want to uh, thank you for scheduling this hearing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, earlier this year, the FCC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking to revise the system under which AT&T is regulated. The Commission has proposed moving from, as you mentioned, a rate of return model, which regulates AT&T by limiting its profits <coughs> to one at which profits would be capped. I think the Commission is attempting to be responsive to changes in the telecommunications industry and to adapt to the environment created by the divestiture decision in 1982. I know from a number of statements that were made at the time of the Commission's notice that some individuals and groups are concerned at the impact the price cap proposal would have on consumers. I want to reinforce those concerns and urge the Commission to very carefully weigh the comments it receives from consumer groups and others. But I don't believe those concerns ought to prevent the Commission from going forward, from moving ahead with its work in this area. I think the price cap proposal could offer the prospect of protecting consumers if properly structured, while also stimulating the private sector to be more innovative, more productive, and more responsive to the increasing level of competition in the telecommunications field. For those reasons, uh, Chairman Patrick, I hope you will certainly give this matter a top priority in the deliberations of the Commission, and that will, you will proceed expeditiously in making a final decision on this proposal. And above <coughs> all, be certain to take into, into account all of the constructive comments that I'm sure will be made by the various consumer representatives. <coughs> As you do, I also hope you will give very careful attention to another proposal, and that is 
if we are going to go to a price cap to include local exchange carriers or LECs in the approach mm -hmm. also. There is clearly, in my view, a close interrelationship between the LECs and the long distance carriers. And I think the Commission was correct in including the LECs in its notice of proposed rulemaking. I think this aspect of the question deserves very serious consideration, and I hope, and I certainly hope, and uh, am certain that you will examine it closely in the weeks and months ahead. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, move to put the remainder of my statement in its entirety in the mm -hmm. record and in the interest of time. I want to thank you once again for scheduling this hearing and look forward to the testimony from our witnesses and yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired, and without objection, the balance of the statement will be included in the record. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I commend you for your efforts to consistently enliven the debate in the Telecommunications Finance and Consumer Protection Subcommittee after much discussion elsewhere on this hill, you have finally brought the subject of prophylaxis to this committee. <laughs> Not only that, in the, in the age of the 17-year locus, Mr. Chairman, you have also uh, enhanced the debate here with the subject of entomology. Just so you'll know, just, just so the gentleman, if you would yield, I was quoting the Justice Department Ed Meese statement up to us, okay? So the word prophylactic came from Ed Meese, not from me, okay? <laughs> Just so you know. We didn't, we didn't call it a prophylactic when I was growing up. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. <laughs> in, in all debates, there is the source and then there is the leak. <laughs> Uh, I like to think of myself. I like to think of. I would like to think of myself as the source in this. Uh <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, these are uh, very important hearings, and uh, we we live now in the post-divestiture world where the game has changed. And I'm not sure that uh, the rules have been changed to accommodate this changed world. It may well be that rate of return regulation has become obsolete, and I certainly look forward to the uh, testimony of our witnesses today, and, and the chairman and the commissioners, and the other witnesses as well. And when, you, when you think of it, uh, rate of return regulation uh, existed because a monopoly existed, but once once you change that game, and there is no longer, and in, let's face it, in, in say in business communications, which is the leading profit maker in these telecommunications areas today, 59% uh, is controlled by the lead uh, player in this game. That's not essentially a monopoly, but when you think of it, uh, where is the incentive in rate of return regulation to reduce cost, to increase efficiencies and reduce cost? As a matter of fact, the pressure is there in another direction. So if we talk about increased efficiencies and reduced cost as being the goal for the consumer, uh, maybe we better look at some alternatives to uh, rate of return regulation. Uh, it's not as if it's a totally revolutionary idea in its entirety. Some 12 states, including my own home state of Pennsylvania, have been dealing with some other form of uh, regulation, uh, particularly uh, the <coughs> price cap. <coughs> so, uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, uh, I'd like to make one other comment. The, the uh, technology that one would apply in this industry uh, to stimulate efficiencies and to stimulate cost reductions for consumers, that technology is driven, is essentially driven by by the way the return or the profit can, can arrive to a particular company. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it's a different technology that increases volume of investment in rate base than the technology that increases efficiency for service delivery. So w we need a system in this highly competitive 
business where we where our players are also global, global competitors we need a system that spurs the technology of cost reduction and efficiency not the technology of enhancing investment in a rate base so uh, I thank the chairman for his indulgence I'd also like to thank uh, Commissioner Dawson for her excellent excellent service uh, as I understand it next week is his confirmation as Deputy uh, Secretary of Trans Transportation. And of course, we all wish her well in that new endeavor. We'll miss her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. At, at this time, I'd like to note that Mr. Swift, Swift has a bill on the floor this morning and will be unable to attend uh, this hearing. And he would like his opening statement inserted at the record at this point. And he would also like to submit in writing questions to the Commission uh, with the hope that the Commission would respond to them in a timely fashion. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Tonkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, I want to join with my colleagues in thanking <coughs> Commissioner Dawson for her outstanding service on the FCC during the last several years and to wish her well at the Department of Transportation. I, along with probably most of you, have been busy compiling my list of requests from the Department of Transportation, <laughs> eagerly awaiting her arrival on the scene. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, the primary uh, purpose of regulating telephone rates is consumer protection, and I believe that we should not lose sight of this in our hearing and policy making. A change to the price cap regulatory approach for interstate telephone rates from the traditional rate of return method is a major shift in telecommunications policy. I have reviewed the pros and cons of the price cap approach, and I believe that it is an interesting concept that is worthy of serious consideration. I commend the Federal Communications Commission and Chairman Patrick for developing this innovative regulatory approach. One major disadvantage of the traditional rate of return method is that it encourages inefficient expansions of the telephone company's physical plant because a company can only increase its profits by increasing its investment. Rate of return regulation is also very complex and expensive, and its administrative costs have increased tremendously since the AT&T divestiture, particularly for small telephone companies. In addition to the price caps and rate of return methods, I believe that we should also carefully examine deregulation in the interstate uh, inter-exchange market. However, the market should only be deregulated if there is sufficient competition. The policy in my home state of Iowa regarding intrastate services is that a service that is subject to competition is not regulated. This policy has worked out well in Iowa, and the State Public Service Commission, the Iowa Utilities Board, believes that the policy should be extended to the interstate services. Some of the criticisms of the price cap method that I have seen derive from historical experiences dealing with electric utilities. The main problems encountered involved rate structures that failed to meet customer needs. Rate discrimination, whereby favored customers received service at reduced rates, and a reluctance to embrace new technologies in a rapidly changing industry. I recognize that the relationship between the price cap experience that occurred long ago in the electric utilities industry and the current situation may be somewhat weak, but nevertheless, I believe that pa the past experiences are worthy of review as we look at this new proposal. One factor that must be taken into careful consideration is the possibility of fostering local exchange bypass by a limited transition to price caps, whereby AT&T is permitted to shift to price cap regulation and the local exchanges are not. Since 50% of AT&T's costs consist of local exchange access costs, AT&T may be motivated to bypass the local exchange under a pi price cap arrangement. In this scenario, it appears that the large users would find it beneficial to connect directly to AT&T, leaving the uh, remaining smaller residential users to support the local exchange. Under local exchange rate of return regulation, the small user may then see his rates increase because of large user migration off the exchange. Mr. Chairman, I realize that the rate of return and price cap regulatory methods both have their advantages and disadvantages. However, I believe that the price cap method has merits and is worthy of serious consideration. I am very interested in examining the concerns about the price cap method, and I look forward to hearing our witnesses today. <coughs> Gentlemen's time has expired. I chair recognize once again the gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to request unanimous consent that the statement of Congressman Bliley be inserted in the record in full at this point as he has an urgent matter that will prevent him from attending this hearing. Without uh, objection, uh, his uh, opening statement will be included in the record at this <coughs> point. Uh, that 
concludes the period for opening statements by members of the subcommittee. Uh, we now turn to members of the subcommittee for our questions, and the first uh, round of uh, question goes to uh, Mr. Siner. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's, I'm sorry. What was one I think you have heard? To let us let us turn first to. Uh, Maybe I should have just stayed in bed. <laughs> uh, the first uh, panel is um, the Honorable uh, Dennis Patrick, who is the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. The Honorable Patricia Diaz-Dennis, who is the commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission. Um, the Honorable Mimi Wafworth uh, Dawson, who is the commissioner of the Federal, Com Federal Communications Commission. And the Honorable Alfred Sykes, who is the assistant secretary for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Uh, we welcome all of you, and we'll first recognize you, Chairman Patrick, for an opening statement. Well, thank you, and uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, also accompanying me to the table is Mr. Gerald Brock, uh, Chief of our Common Carrier uh, Bureau. Mr. Chairman, as I testified before the subcommittee during my first appearance uh, as FCC Chairman, the Commission's overriding goal is to promote consumer welfare and the public interest. Where regulations are needed, it is our job to supply them, but it is also our responsibility to seek to improve them whenever possible in the changing telecommunications environment. This goal is the driving force behind the proceedings we are here to discuss today. The Commission has proposed to replace cost of service regulation of dominant carriers with an approach that protects consumers <coughs> by directly regulating the rates for such carriers' interstate services, the so-called price cap approach. The Commission also is in the process of implementing cost allocation rules that ensure that <coughs> consumers of regulated <coughs> services are not forced to foot the bill for carriers' activities in unregulated markets. Allow me just a few moments to review these items or these proceedings in turn. Since the 1960s, the Commission has relied upon so-called rate of return regulation. Rate of return regulation, by its very nature, tends to place upward pressure on rates and frustrate technological innovation results that are, of course, antithetical to consumer welfare. The Commission is then forced to regulate in an effort to prevent carriers from following incentives that have been created in part by our own regulatory system. Mr. Chairman, I believe our consideration of the price cap approach responds to the need that we both recognize for coherent, forward-looking policies. Price caps would encourage carriers to cut costs, innovate, and to realize efficiencies, and would reduce carriers' incentives and ability to cross-subsidize. These changes could lead to improvements that never would have occurred in a rate of return environment. At the same time, ratepayers would be protected by price caps. The caps themselves would set a direct limit on how much ratepayers would be charged on the upside. Our proposed use of a productivity index would also guarantee that ratepayers would benefit from <coughs> telephone company efficiencies resulting from the caps. Moreover, adjustments to the caps would ensure a flow-through to consumers of the effects of such external changes as reductions in access charges. Although I believe that price caps promise, therefore, significant potential benefits to consumers when compared to rate of return regulation, it is equally clear that only a successful implementation of a price cap approach would permit the actual realization of these benefits. As we analyze the record in this docket, let me assure you and each member of this committee that I and my fellow commissioners uh, will examine those comments very, very caref carefully in order to ensure ourselves that we satisfy at least four basic concerns. First, the price cap plan, that the price cap plan will put consumers in a better position than they are today. For residential consumers in particular, this means that following a reasonable period of time for implementation, rates will be lower in real dollar terms than they likely would have been under rate of return. Second, the proposal would present no threat to commission policies and programs that are designed to benefit low-income households and rural Americans. Third, the proposal will be structured to ensure the continuation of high-quality telephone service. And fourth, the plan will not disturb the Commission's commitment to fostering competition and preventing discrimination in the provision of telecommunication services. I recognize that you have questions about our proposal and we welcome this opportunity to address these concerns and explain <coughs> the program. We may not be able to answer all your questions at this time, but I believe that if provided a reasonable opportunity, we will be able to implement a proposal, a price cap proposal, that benefits consumers and one that will be worthy of your support, Mr. Chairman and that of the other members of this committee. I truly believe that this proceeding is our best chance to develop a sensible telecommunications policy framework, 
one that is sturdy enough to withstand the rapid changes in this industry, uh, the changes we are sure to experience as we move into the next century. Mr. Chairman, I would like to turn briefly to the second subject of this hearing, controlling cross-subsidies between a dominant carrier's regulated and non-regulated activities that are harmful to ratepayers. I strongly believe that our cost allocation policies are well thought out and effectively address the need to protect consumers against harmful cost-shifting activity. The GAO last week released a study reviewing the Commission's efforts to police cost-shifting activities. It is important to point out that the study is not an attack <coughs> on the Commission's cost allocation policies per se. Indeed, the study concludes that the various actions taken by the Commission are essential to policing cost-shifting activity. The study expresses concern, however, that the Commission's resources, particularly in the auditing area, are insufficient to assure that our policies will be enforced adequately. Now, we appreciate the concerns expressed by the GAO. We have been reviewing and evaluating our resources and requirements for some time now. We believe it is important to focus on all aspects of the Commission's accounting program as an integrated whole. Nevertheless, uh, as I mentioned in some detail in my written statement, which I'll submit, we also plan to assign additional resources to the audit function, which was, of course, a principal focus of the GAO report. We believe this level of resources will be sufficient to assure that our policies are effectively enforced. Uh, and therefore, Mr. Chairman, I would be happy at this time to answer any questions that you may have about the subjects uh, I have addressed. But let me just say uh, briefly, in addition, Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, compliment you on holding a hearing on the cross-subsidy question at the, at the same time we discuss the matter of price caps. Uh, you obviously uh, recognize that these two subjects are intimately related. Uh, in fact, rate of return, uh, a rate of return methodology uh, creates the incentive to cross-subsidize that we are then required to regulate in an effort to prevent. I firmly believe that a rate cap proposal uh, would create uh, uh, a disincentive to cross-subsidize or at least would eliminate that perverse uh, incentive and therefore there are indeed complementarities between uh, caps uh, and our concern, our ongoing concern about the cross-subsidy question. So I'm happy to have this opportunity to discuss these, these two subjects uh, together. And uh, with that, I will uh, conclude. Thank you. Gentlemen, this time's expired. Um, <coughs> do any of the other FCC commissioners wish to testify this time? We'll turn then to um, the Honorable Al Sykes, the Assistant Secretary of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have <coughs> submitted a statement for the record, and I would now like to uh, provide a uh, <coughs> summary of that statement. Let me begin by underscoring that we all share a commitment to a fair and equitable distribution of communication services. This administration firmly supports universal service. It is not just a consideration, but an imperative. NTIA initiated in the fall of 1986 a study of rate of return regulation. We did this because while director of the Missouri Department of Consumer Affairs, I saw rate of return regulation up close. I saw that it did not keep prices down if market forces were moving in the opposite direction and that it exacted a huge cost. It was, as one legislator said, a cost plus system and I know of few people who are dumb enough to buy things that way. The current system generates the wrong incentives. In most businesses, management has an incentive to reduce costs, improve productivity, and thus to increase profits. Under rate of return regulation, however, the more you spend, the more you make. In an economy where productivity is more and more critical to global competitiveness, this <coughs> is precisely the kind of incentive structure the government should avoid. <coughs> so we became convinced that new approaches are needed. What we basically concluded was first existing price and profit controls ought to be removed from services that are effectively competitive. And second, a price cap system ought to be established for non-competitive offerings. Let's look first at the one major service that we believe is effectively competitive, inter-exchange services. There are more than 500 companies selling long-distance services, including three large nationwide facilities-based carriers. Competition has stimulated tremendous investment in new transmission <coughs> facilities, better than $20 billion over just the past four years. Technology also increasingly offers large users alternatives. There is both price and service competition. So we concluded that much less regulation of the long distance market is in order. The regulatory approach needed is not 
price regulation but making certain that equal access obligations are completed the predatory practice pricing is not practice in short to maintain a competitive environment within which we don't have to worry about price regulation let me explain now what we concluded regarding most local telephone offerings most of those services are not very competitive some are vulnerable to competition but they aren't very competitive today so we concluded that regulation is needed after looking at the various alternatives we concluded that price cap regulation was the best and for basically three reasons first it should be simpler to administer and significantly less costly the n t i a study disclosed that rate of return regulation currently costs one point one billion dollars per year second as i said earlier cost plus regulation like cost plus home building produces the wrong incentives we want people to encourage productivity third rate based regulation causes competitive problems <clears throat> where management can recover costs from a captive customer base there will be cross subsidies one fundamental attraction of price caps is that they largely eliminate the cost shifting problem in t i s price cap approach would not allow companies productivity or tax windfalls as once the price is capped the applicable index would consider both cost increases and savings we also urge a regulatory oversight role to assure that companies do not maximize profits at the expense of network or performance integrity we have entered a period of stable to declining telephone costs and prices recent figures indicated for example that common carriers have more than one hundred forty four billion dollars invested in a network that is residentially used only twenty four point two minutes per day the industry has an incentive to price to stimulate more network use not the reverse stimulating improved productivity is so in so important an industry has to benefit the country total carrier operating costs amount to more than a hundred billion dollars yearly if all our proposal accomplished were a modest five percent improvement that plus the savings from a streamlined regulatory system would amount to about six billion dollars a year and in t i s proposal is hardly a partisan position in actuality this is an area where states have clearly taken the policy lead in the twelve states that have eliminated rate of return regulation for a t and t democrats control the legislatures in all but one of those states and they control seven of the twelve state houses pricing flexibility regulatory reform and greater reliance on competition seem to be ideas more accepted in the states than in washington <coughs> in conclusion mr chairman few industries are more important to this country's economic future than telecommunications and few have experienced such dramatic changes the structural competitive and technological changes should prompt fundamental regulatory reform thank you gentleman's time has uh, expired uh, i think that uh, concludes the uh, time for the uh, testimony from the uh, opening panel of witnesses and we'll now turn to our uh, subcommittee for questions and we will first recognize the gentleman from oklahoma mr signer thank you ed Mr. Patrick, let me start. In the Computer 3 proceeding, let me see, the FCC said uh, greater benefits to the consumer are going to occur uh, if we have separate subsidiary requirements and if they're eliminated. And then the FCC went on to say that the, the benefits of non-structural safeguards outweigh the cost to the companies. Can you provide for the subcommittee uh, the FCC's cost-benefit analysis which made you come to that conclusion? We'd be happy to uh, supplement the record with the uh, information that we have that goes to that, uh, that question, uh, uh, Congressman. Let me uh, uh, respond to your question in, in a general way at this time, and Let then, me yes, we will supplement the record. In answering that, <coughs> add this to your answer, too. Do you know how much it will cost the companies to comply with those uh, non-structural safeguards? Well, we can provide the, the estimates that we have. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know how detailed the information uh, that we have at this point is on that, but we'll be happy to supplement the record with uh, the information that we have. But well, obviously, if you came to that conclusion, you have some kind of estimates. Well, that's that's correct. Okay. Uh, let me just respond generally to the matter of uh, structural uh, uh, separation uh, versus non-structural safeguards. Uh, it is clear to the Commission uh, that, uh, and it seems intuitive, uh, the structural separation involves some costs. Obviously, one has to uh, uh, pay for the cost of duplicated facilities and duplicated personnel. 
Uh, there is also a larger cost which attaches itself to structural separation, and it's the one that really animates the Commission's concern in this area, and this is the potential loss of services within the public network, services that may be uneconomic uh, uh, when provided on a structurally separated basis. It is the loss of those services within the network uh, that I think we are really concerned because, of course, that goes directly to uh, the, uh, uh, the consumers who might uh, uh, be uh, disposed to utilize those services. Non-structural safeguards, assuming those safeguards are adequate to deal with the cross-subsidy uh, problem and to deal with potential uh, competitive problems, which I believe that they are, and we can talk about that, uh, offers enormous advantages. Number one, and this is often forgotten, uh, if enhanced services are provided within the network, then the enhanced service providers and the users of those enhanced services are picking up some portion of the overhead, some portion of the cost of a network that can also be used for providing basic services to voice uh, users of the network. That's an important uh, benefit. Mm. The second thing is, uh, with respect to the utility of non-structural safeguards, uh, that I don't want to see, and I don't think this Commission, I don't think the Congress wants to see, uh, all of the enhancements, <coughs> all of the so-called fruits of the information age driven into private networks. Private networks are valuable, they're important, they provide uh, a great service to the public, but we want to see the public switched network, which is the network that your average consumer accesses uh, more often than not, also uh, develop uh, these, these technologies so that we can all have access to these technologies. And I believe that without non-structural safeguard approach to this question, we'll see less of that rather than more of that. And that's, that's the Commission's concern. Let me ask you something else. You know, in the report that uh, Ed and I released last week, um, I think I summarized it uh, saying that the, the FCC is very similar to the Bible. The mind was willing, but the flesh was weak. You are telling us this morning in your statement, we believe GAO has underestimated the resources already assigned to the administration of the program and additional resources we plan to assign to that program. I mean, obviously, it's got to be a concern when you only have presently 15 <coughs> auditors uh, that are covering over a $150 billion industry. Now, you say that you're going to make requests again, as you have in the past, to OMB with respect to more auditors and allocation. Well, that's not new. You've come up here and done that before. What do you think you're going to do this time differently that's going to convince OMB that you need these auditors uh, and that you're going to be successful. And moving from 15 to 18 full-time positions doesn't give me a lot of confidence. Okay, that's uh, obviously a, a, an excellent uh, a focus because it goes right to the heart of the, uh, the GAO report and, and the heart, I might say, of our concerns, my concerns in this area as well. Let me respond to you in, in a specific way and then a more general way. We will continue to uh, uh, make known to OMB what we believe our requirements are in the way of, uh, of resources. Uh, obviously, we're all aware that we're living in an era in which uh, we don't have all, the government does not have all the financial resources. What are you going to do differently that that might than the pitch last year you made? Be optimal. Well, I'll be making the pitch. Uh, but, let, but let me answer your question very specifically and say yeah. what we're going to do differently. What we're going to do differently is we are going to reprioritize our resources internally, which is to say we will go and we will make the best case that we can for the resources we believe that we need, and then we will receive from this Congress uh, a budget uh, or maybe a continuing resolution. In any case, we'll have a number to work with. Long before the GAO report came out, I sat down with my managing director and with our chief of the Common Carrier Bureau, and I said, non-structural <coughs> safeguards are a priority of mine. They are going to be a priority of my administration at the FCC, and therefore, consistent with the parameters of the law and restraints with respect to the allocations of uh, funding as a budget matter, I want to reprioritize and take some dollars uh, from other accounts and put them into the uh, non-structural safeguard arena, specifically uh, in the auditing area, to make sure we have an adequate uh, uh, capability. And you think 18 auditors up from 15 is enough? Well, that goes to my the, the, the second half of the way I'd respond to your, your question. I think that will improve uh, the situation, but I think more critical than that, and, and the GAO report recognized this, what's really critical is not so much the number of auditors, although that's obviously important, uh, but the ability of those auditors to get out into the field and sit down with the companies and conduct uh, spot audits uh, or what, whatever is necessary, and that goes to travel funding. And again, I have directed the managing director to, uh, within the constraints of the law, to make available more funding for travel by those auditors. Uh, we are going to, uh, we have made a commitment internally to more than double uh, 
uh, the travel budget for auditors uh, as compared to the 87 mark, which was $35,000. Well, you understand why I'm concerned because, as you know, you're uh, required by law to give us positive assurances that these things are being made, and you have in turn switched that responsibility to the CPAs of the companies to give you positive assurances. And given the fact that you have only 18 auditors that are going to get the positive assurances, which from there you're going to bootstrap our positive assurances, I mean, I've got to have some concern whether or not I'm getting this third hand and whether or not we've even gotten it right. I mean, uh, you know, common sense tells me, and I have 40 <laughs> hours of accounting and, uh, and undergraduate work and uh, specialty in business, you can't do it with 18 auditors. I don't care how disciplined, how committed you are, you just cannot audit an industry. Mr. Brock, do you have a comment to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Steinar. Uh, yes, uh, it's certainly something that I've been concerned with. Uh, prior to my current position, I was in charge of our accounting and audits division and was responsible for making some of these larger budget requests that didn't always go through. Uh, working within the constraints that we have, uh, I think that we have developed an effective program, and let me just outline briefly the, the way that we've done it. We recognize that we were short on internal auditors and travel funds and given the budgetary process likely to remain short in order to do an effective job of the entire industry because as you suggest with your question it would take a very large increase in the current resources to fully audit the uh, the cost allocations of all the companies so what we have done is set up the program to require uh, the independent audits by each company on an annual basis with a positive level of assurance and as you're certainly aware uh, independent auditors do have stringent legal requirements for responsibility to third parties we then we get their work papers as well as their official audit report we also have set up an automated reporting system which will allow us for the first time to have a very comprehensive control <coughs> of the financial flows throughout the industry uh, in our own records. I feel that by comparing the auditor's work papers from the outside with the reports from our automated reporting system, we are then able to focus very tightly on what is necessary for our own auditors and we are planning to make the spot checks in order to guarantee the quality assurance uh, for those independent auditors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just conclude with 15 seconds. You know, this is all fine and dandy, <coughs> and, and your request take care of uh, FY89. Problem is, this thing goes into effect in 88, and the, the <coughs> checking and the auditing, which we're going to need, needs to be in place now. And this member, at least, remains unconvinced that 15 or 18 auditors uh, can do the job that we intended. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Uh, Chairman Patrick, in choosing how to regulate uh, carriers, the FCC must fulfill its obligations under the Communications Act to ensure that rates are just and reasonable. How does the price cap proposal for long-distance rates meet the just and reasonable test? <coughs> Congressman, I, uh, we believe very strongly that, uh, in fact, the price cap uh, proposal will be a more effective uh, mechanism of ensuring that uh, rates uh, are just and reasonable uh, in the long run. Let me explain that. Uh, the standard that you uh, uh, mention is a statutory standard uh, uh, set forth in the Communications Act. The uh, Act does not give us a great deal of elaboration as to what exactly it means. Some help is provided by the case law. The case law suggests that a just and reasonable rate is a rate uh, which is within the z a zone of reasonableness. The zone of reasonableness is bounded at one end by the company's interests, at the other end uh, by the interests of consumers in not being subjected to undue exercises of market power. Bottom line, the Commission has a great deal of discretion. Obviously, one of the things we look at uh, uh, is costs uh, in that, that equation. 
the reason we believe that the cap proposal will actually be a more effective mechanism in making sure that we maintain or sustain a pricing system that is within that zone of reasonable reasonableness and in fact is falling over time is because of a much improved incentive structure as was mentioned by yourself and a number of the members in our opening statements let me ask you this where would you set the initial rates would you set the initial rates for example at existing levels that is uh, one of the questions that we have uh, addressed in the notice. Uh, there are a number of uh, ideas and a number of proposals with respect to uh, where you would set the initial rates. Uh, one a distinct possibility is to utilize the, uh, the rates that we already have in place as they have uh, already been found by the Commission to be not uh, unlawful and within that zone of reasonableness. Well, then, if you do that and the carrier has cost savings, how are those cost savings passed on to the consumer? It depends on the type of uh, cost saving. If it were, for instance, a saving that, were, uh, that was enjoyed by an inter-exchange carrier as a result of a reduction in access charges, we would flow through that cost saving. We would mandate, we would require uh, that that cost saving uh, be flowed through uh, to uh, consumers, just as we have uh, done uh, in a rate of return environment. Uh, if there were cost savings uh, in the nature of general productivity increases, which is to say improvements in technology that bring costs down, uh, that would uh, be brought about and passed along to consumers by a productivity index. And let me just explain, because some of this is a little, a little complex, that when we refer to a productivity index, what we're talking about is, is the following proposition. We wouldn't just cap rates. We would cap rates and we would say to consumers, rates are not going to go any higher than that absent an extraordinary showing uh, by the company involved as to why they should go higher than that. So they're basically capped on the upside. But we wouldn't leave it at that. We would also factor in uh, a, a number of adjustments that would reflect changes in costs uh, that are beyond the Excuse carrier's me. control. Could you cl clarify that last point? I don't want to lose sight of the fact <laughs> you said rates would be capped and they wouldn't go higher. But isn't in there a CPI factor, factor uh, CPI increase factored into your proposal? Yes, that, that's so that's that every year, no matter what happens, and and correct me if I'm wrong on this, no matter what happens every year, there's a CPI increase automatically lopped on. Is that also correct? That is one of the the proposals. Uh, one of the issues we are discussing are the ways in which that cap and the number that is suggested by that cap will be adjusted automatically and periodically over time. One of the elements that is often suggested, in fact, it's <coughs> been a part of every cap proposal I've ever read about, uh, is uh, some adjustment for the value of money, a CPI proposal. Yes. So the cap would be changing over time. Uh, it would be changing possibly by, again, these are all issues, a CPI factor. It would be changing by flow through of, for instance, access charges. But it would also be changing uh, and generally be falling as a result of a productivity index. Productivity index would reflect the general, our perception of the general productivity increases uh, in the industry. If that, if costs have been falling by X percent over time, we could factor that X percent into the cap, so the cap would automatically fall uh, by X percent each year. So consumers would be guaranteed the opportunity to participate uh, in those productivity uh, increases by virtue of the cap. All right, you mentioned a, well, let's take AT&T, for example. If the costs fall due to a factor beyond their control, for example, a reduction in access charges, or let's say a change in the tax laws, you then say that there would be a benefit to the consumer specifically because these savings are going to be passed on to the consumer in some degree. Now, or in some manner, I think. <coughs> now, what's the difference between what you're saying now and what currently Zik exists under the <coughs> scheme of things as they are now utilized? As to that particular point, there isn't any difference, and that's, that's a key point. A lot of uh, persons have observed that uh, long-distance rates have been falling, so why would we want to change the system? Well, the drop in long-distance rates has been driven uh, in substantial uh, measure by the access charge flow-throughs. So that point is analytically neutral with respect to caps versus uh, rate of return because in a cap regime, we would ensure that those flow-throughs uh, would continue. But you ask about the difference. The difference is that uh, because the cap 
involves, uh, incorporates changes in cost that are beyond the control of the carrier, there is a vastly improved incentive structure under a cap proposal than there exists in a rate of return environment. As was pointed out, if I might just mention briefly, uh, in a rate of return environment, uh, there are perverse incentives to inflate the rate base. The reason being, the only way you can increase your dollar revenues is to pump more dollars into the rate base. <coughs> there is a perverse incentive there. There is an incentive to cross-subsidize. Mm -hmm. If I can take a dollar out of a competitive enterprise and put it on a, a regulated enterprise and convince the FCC that it properly uh, belongs there, uh, that is a useful exercise. There is a perverse incentive. Uh, it also, rated return environment, also destroys the incentive to economize or to innovate. Why? Because if you economize and start making more money, or if you innovate and come up with a new technology and, and it vastly increases demand, what do we do? The next year we take it away from you. So why should I do it? Perverse incentives in a rate, rate of return environment. The cap environment, to answer your question, the difference is the cap environment uh, improves the incentive structure. It eliminates the perverse incentive. There's no reason for me to inflate the rate base because it doesn't make me any money. There's no reason for me to cross-subsidize because it doesn't make me any money. There is every reason for me to economize, uh, to cut my costs, to innovate, to increase demand, because by virtue of the cap, I may get to keep some of the entrepreneurial profit that results. But, and this is a key point, by virtue of the cap, by virtue of the productivity index, we're also going to ensure that consumers share in the benefits of that improved incentive structure. Right, let me ask you two quick questions. Are, number one, are you locked into the CPI index increase? No, sir. All right, number two, if AT&T or the local exchange companies make bad investments <laughs> that add to their costs <coughs> under the cap, would those costs then be passed on to the consumer under the cap proposal as you have described it here this morning? No, sir, and that's, that's uh, the, uh, I can't keep speak for all circumstances, but in general not. The utility of the, of the cap proposal is that creates the proper incentives <coughs> for the company not to make it bad investments because absent an extraordinary showing, they cannot raise prices above that cap, and so they're going to have to live with it. <coughs> what are they going to do? They're going to make good investments. <coughs> they're going to make investments that are consistent with consumer demand, and that's exactly what we want them to do. Well, I, I know my time's expired, but you know what troubles me about the response to the question is, you say they're going to make good investments. I don't know of a company or anyone who can say they're always going to make good investments. Let's assume hypothetically that they do make a bad investment and that they do lose money on some endeavor. What happens then? That's what I want to know. Well, presumptively, the tariff <coughs> and, uh, and the uh, company uh, has to live with the, the profits that uh, represent the difference between their costs and that cap. And there is an incentive, therefore, uh, for the company to make investments that will improve the profit margin and not uh, injure the profit margin. Now, there is a legal restraint at the top end, and that is that the commission cannot uh, impose a, a tariff or sustain <coughs> a, a maintain a tariff that is confiscatory. So if it were confiscatory, uh, then the company could come in and make, make a showing uh, as a matter of right, as a matter of law, uh, to, to raise that cap. Jerry, did you? Uh, Mr. Brown? Just, just to emphasize that uh, as a general matter, the answer is uh, they would have to absorb the, the cost of that bad investment in their own profit. Uh, there could be some extraordinary circumstances that would allow them to make a showing, but then we would have the right to show that they made the bad investment and to disallow it at that time. So in the ordinary scheme of things, if they make a bad investment, they lose money, they eat the cost? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes itself. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, the record uh, indicates that the telephone industry is a declining cost industry. Um, we have a chart over here that we've put together that uh, can help to uh, demonstrate what uh, has happened to uh, telephone prices uh, over the years compared to the consumer price index, which is uh, a factor built into your price cap scheme. Um, prices have gone down by about 60% in real dollars in relation to the consumer <laughs> price index over the past 25 years. Uh, costs are expected to continue going down 
due to technological innovation uh, in addition uh, much of the cost of implementing these new technologies such as fiber optics digital switching etc have already been paid for by the consumers under the existing system <coughs> I'll be glad to. The, uh, the charges are, uh, does that include uh, <coughs> simply local service, or is that local and long distance service? That's both. That's all service. Intrastate, interstate, and local calls. Hey. U.S. Uh, the U.S. The, Bu the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics on that. So as you can see, the red chart, the red bars, tell you how fast the consumer price index has increased <coughs> overall. The blue bar. Uh, gives you an indication of what has happened to telephone calls in that particular period of time. It is a declining um, cost industry. Uh, just for, uh, and I, I'm, I'm taking this out of uh, the, the uh, testimony of the Consumer Federation of America right now, just to switch over for a second, but if we had had an increase w at the consumer price index since the passage of the Communications Act, um, in 1934, the average bill for a residential rate payer today would be $80 a month. Right now, the average consumer pays $35 a month overall for interstate, intrastate, and local charge. Say, so just so you can get an idea as to the difference that exists, and this decline hasn't just happened since, uh, um, you know, since the 1984 breakup or, you know, anything <coughs> along that line. I mean, this has been a consistent pattern in this industry over the years, and going back 25 years we see it, but it's, it's part of the history. Um, the rate of uh, return regulation is designed to pass through these savings, that is the savings that have in fact been um, made over the years by this declining cost industry to the consumers. And it has done so to a very large extent. Not perfect, but it has tried to do its best. The question is, will the price cap pass through these cost savings oh, oh. to the consumers? In the absence of competition, what incentives are there for carriers to pass through these savings to consumers under the price cap since they're guaranteed these profits, the, the CPI, uh, year after year? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that we have to examine the experience of states that have adopted the price cap and I think you'll agree that under the price cap, the carrier has realized supra-competitive profits in some states, and in other states haven't passed savings through equally to all service categories. For example, according to Maryland People's Council, <coughs> we'll testify later, in the month ending in March 1987, AT&T of Maryland realized a rate of return of 125%. AT&T says it wasn't 125 percent, it was 48 percent. In either case, the profit is excessive by anyone's standards. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your statement that the Commission will not implement, implement the price cap if it does not put consumers in a better position than they are today, and that rates would have to be lower in real dollar terms. However, in light of the experiences of states like Maryland, and in light of the history of this industry as a declining cost based industry under the rate of <coughs> under the rate of regulation uh, rate of return regulation scheme um, what assurances can the FCC uh, proposal give to us that the savings will be passed on if there are savings uh, to consumers and that they will not in fact result in supra competitive profits for the carriers Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Well, you've, you, you've made a number of uh, observations. Let me try to respond to them, uh, responding to your last and specific comment first. They can be guaranteed that uh, those uh, external <coughs> changes in costs, such <coughs> as uh, access charge uh, reductions, uh, or, uh, tax uh, alterations, uh, what have you, will be passed through <coughs> because we will mandate that they will be passed through. Um, they can be guaranteed that they will participate by price reductions in the general productivity improvements over the years by and through a productivity index, which will require <coughs> automatically uh, that, the, uh, that the cap fall uh, by uh, X percent uh, uh, each year. 
let me now that having been said let me go back to some of your original observations because they're they're important and i and i must say they go to the precisely the sort of issues that we are thinking through right now that the commenters have addressed and we're going to think about very carefully before going any further in this area number one c p i is just one issue it is among the factors that are typically suggested as as relevant here the commission has not made any decisions in that regard Number two, with respect to CPI, the current rate, uh, rate of return regime factors in inflation. Uh, so it, that, that uh, uh, impact or that factor is part of the rate of return regime uh, today. So it is not as if we're suggesting that some new factor that is not, uh, ha has never been considered heretofore would be considered. The fact is that what, happened, what has happened over the years is that even though we have had some period of inflation, the productivity increases have more than surpassed that inflationary uh, mm -hmm. pressure, and therefore you've had uh, generally declining uh, uh, prices. Subscriber line charges would be, uh, or, or the, the access charge reductions resulting from subscriber line charges would be passed through. Um, as far as uh, uh, the productivity index, as I've indicated, uh, it would be uh, uh, the general productivity mm -hmm. improvement could be reflected uh, in, in the index. And let me just say in that regard, the reason I believe that consumers will be better off in a price cap environment uh, has to do with this productivity index, and it has to do with this, this observation you make about generally uh, a declining cost. Mm -hmm. If we say, if we observe that the productivity improvement, uh, the reduction in cost and therefore general productivity improvement has been X percent uh, over the years in a rate of return environment, we can capture all of that gain for consumers on average uh, by a productivity index which requires the cap to come down automatically X percent. But we can do better than that under a rate cap proposal. The reason can we can you do... Tell us what a productivity index is? Yes, a productivity index is a number. And How it, do we get that number? Well, it, it, uh, one can get at that number uh, by and through a notice and comment uh, proceeding. One can uh, get at that number by uh, looking at the historical data with respect to the general productivity <coughs> improvement in the industry. Let me make this more real by saying, talking about the British situation. The British <coughs> uh, have a rate cap uh, proposal in place, which they have just reviewed and are very pleased with, uh, in which their cap uh, is adjusted automatically by something called the retail <coughs> price index minus three. Now that minus three, uh, three, three points. Uh, is uh, uh, their productivity index in effect. They're, they're betting that, uh, that the industry can improve productivity and reduce costs by about 3% per year. Uh, so the productivity index is a number, and it's a number that requires prices to come down uh, automatically. But let me get back, if I could, and, and complete that thought. The reason I think consumers could be even better off is that we can capture that productivity gain in a productivity <coughs> index in a number but upon the assumption that we're going to improve the incentive structure, upon the assumption uh, that carriers are going to do uh, mm -hmm. even better in the way of reducing cost in pursuit of some entrepreneurial profit, we can uh, make that uh, productivity index uh, even a little bit more so as to ensure that uh, and bring the cap down even a little bit further than has historically been the case uh, in the rate of return environment in order to ensure that uh, consumers uh, participate uh, in uh, the the fruits of an improved incentive structure. Okay, our, our um, difficulty, and we are going to have a roll call in a couple of minutes. Uh, our our difficulty is that um, none of this is in the proposed rulemaking at this point. The specifics are all very, very vague. You've got a Y factor in there, and we don't know what that Y factor is, and therein lies the answer, whatever that might be. And as you can imagine, in an era in which the FCC is priding itself on its deregulatory abilities. And as Mr. Sinar earlier pointed out, whether it be 15 auditors or 18 auditors uh, in a multi-hundred billion dollar industry, um, in order to ascertain some productivity coefficient and substitute <laughs> it for a system which has kept consumer rates very low while also giving us the best telephone system in the world, unquestionably, uh, would have to be something that would have to be pretty well nailed down um, before we would, um, I think, be willing to allow for us to move off into that brave new world, because that's really what it would be. It would be a leap of faith for the consumers and the competitors without a real specific delineation of what, in fact, that Y factor was. 
and uh, and that's the the real uh, difficulty that we see ourselves in right now. Uh, so, yeah, be like unanimous consent to put a very intelligent statement into the record. <coughs> oh. <laughs> Whose statement is this? <laughs> <laughs> My staff. <laughs> Only Joe Biden had met you sooner. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the chair at this time notes that there is a roll call on the floor, and uh, at this point we'll recess and we'll reconvene in about ten minutes. We will return with more of this hearing on the regulation of telephone rates in just a few minutes. <laughs> Join C-SPAN for the next episode of Supreme Court Review. This Saturday, we'll look at the case of Thompson versus Oklahoma. Our guests will share their views on the arguments of capital punishment for juveniles. Supreme Court Review, Saturday at 7 p.m. and again at 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time on C-SPAN. We pause briefly now for a look at what's ahead on C-SPAN. Coming up at 1.10 a.m. Eastern Time, that's 10.10 p.m. Pacific. We bring you an address by the Secretary of Commerce, William Verity, who spoke today at the National Press Club. Then at 2.10 a.m., the focus shifts to the re-regulation of the airline industry in a speech by Oklahoma Congressman Glenn English. At 2.55 a.m. Eastern Time, it's the remarks of Shirley Dennis, Director of the Women's Bureau at the Department of Labor. She spoke at the All in a Day's Work Conference. Coming up next, we resume our coverage of today's hearing on the regulation of telephone rates before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. That committee is chaired by Edward Markey of Massachusetts. it to uh, Chairman Patrick, uh, Commissioner Dawson, so that I can just get one final bit of wisdom from you before you go over to the transportation industry. And I might note that your competence is unquestioned in terms of all of our view after all these years of your uh, testimony before us. And I think that a lot of us will feel a lot more confident in flying knowing that you're over there. Uh, so I just want to let you know that we very much have appreciated and respected the work that you've done. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, fairness and respect with which you've treated me over the last six years and all the members of the committee and the subcommittee. And I'd like to thank you all for your fine words, and uh, I look hope forward to working with you at the Department of Transportation. Great. We are going to miss you. Um, in, uh, in the opening testimony from the uh, chairman, <coughs> it was stated that the rate of return regulation frustrates technological innovation and creates gold plating. However, I think that we can all agree that the United States has the best telephone system in the world, and the system has developed under the rate of return regulation system. Under the present system, telephone companies have favored the newest technologies with the broadest potential for new service application. They have <coughs> an incentive to maintain high-quality service <coughs> because they are guaranteed a rate of return. I'm glad to hear you say that the Commission will not implement the price cap if the Commission can't ensure the continuation of high-quality telephone service that Americans currently enjoy. However, I am concerned that under the price cap, the telephone industry may not have adequate incentives to maintain high-quality service. U.S. industry is often criticized for managing by quarterly earning reports. There are concerns that some industries fail to make adequate investments for the long term uh, so they can realize short-term profits. Won't the price cap present us with an inverse of your theoretical concerns over rate of return regulation? Instead of the so-called incentives like gold plating, won't we see an incentive for cutting costs at the expense of service? Isn't this worse than the problems that other industries create since telephone companies are not subject to effective competitive pressures to improve service uh, quality. How can we be sure that the price cap will not reduce the incentives for innovation? In other words, 
What we would like to avoid here is the law of unintended consequences. Once we take away that close scrutiny, that eye-watering detail that we expect from them right now, and we substitute an incentive for them to just squeeze every dollar out, uh, how can we be sure that they just won't look uh, rather than to the next generation of technology, but rather to their next quarterly earning report in order to make their shareholders, their board of directors, whomever, uh, much more happy because they won't have that extra pressure from uh, some type of oversight. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that's, uh, that's a very important uh, a part of this uh, proposal and an, and an important uh, uh, a question. It is a question which we have recognized and explicitly uh, addressed uh, in, the, uh, in the notice and upon which we will receive comments. It is an issue with respect to which uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we are focused uh, uh, on. Uh, but let me say that I think th the answer to your question is that uh, neither quality uh, nor uh, technological uh, uh, improvements that are consistent with consumer demand uh, will suffer under a rate cap uh, regime. Let me say why I think that is the case. <coughs> Number one, uh, with respect to quality, uh, it is in the company's uh, interest uh, to make uh, investments in quality and to sustain quality. That is because uh, telephone companies make money by people making phone calls, not by people receiving uh, busy signals or suffering uh, uh, blocking uh, <coughs> ratios that are unacceptable or by uh, cutting short their calls because of uh, undue levels of static. Uh, companies uh, make uh, uh, money uh, by having uh, consumers uh, uh, satisfied and having consumers utilize the network more so rather than less so. And that is the fact uh, in both a competitive environment and a, an environment that is not uh, subject to as much competition. Point number two is competition is a factor here. Certainly in the inter-exchange uh, market, uh, uh, quality is a term of the competition that we see uh, developing uh, today. Uh, so I, I should think that there would be a competitive uh, I incentive with respect to uh, quality, especially in the inter-exchange market. With respect to uh, the LECs, remember that what we're regulating... The LECs are the, <laughs> the local exchange. The local exchange uh, companies. Uh, uh, remember that what we're regulating at the FCC is, uh, is access. And I believe that uh, there is a, a competitive restraint there, and it's called bypass. Uh, we often find uh, that one of the reasons uh, for bypass uh, is uh, the feeling that there is insufficient quality being uh, uh, provided uh, in terms of uh, access to the local uh, uh, network. So quality is, uh, is an issue uh, uh, there uh, as well. For those reasons, if as I could know, just complete... If I, if I may just interject, as you know, we still don't have the quantification the, of the bypass that uh, would justify the kinds of radical changes that we're hearing today. And uh, again, as part of the testimony or evidence which you'd present to the subcommittee, it's very important for us to get that bypass information. Even the Huber report casts a very skeptical eye towards the argument that there is significant bypass out there. And if we <coughs> could get it, I think it would be much more helpful in understanding the real threat that exists. I understand, Mr. Chairman, and as you know, we are struggling uh, mightily to provide you with the, uh, the information formatted uh, in a way that, uh, that you uh, would find appropriate. Uh, the bypass uh, a point that I'm making here uh, is a point uh, that has to do with uh, uh, large companies who choose to uh, bypass either uh, by facilities or, or special access uh, bypass. Uh, and, and I have spoken to many of them who have indicated that uh, among the factors that they consider in making that decision is the quality of uh, access to the local network. And my point is simply that even in the local exchange environment... But we still are only talking about, and even in the Huber report, 0.03%, not even a full 1%. And then he multiplied it by a factor of 10 to get it out to 3%, but that was without his ability to identify... Uh, uh, anything more than 0.03%. So it's got to be more, in other words, than a theoretical uh, possibility. It has to be something that's happening in reality for us to consider such a radical right. change. Well, I think that, that quality is a factor that in reality is considered in making bypass decisions only because I've had many CEOs of companies that have chosen to uh, bypass uh, cite that as, as one reason. But the third point with respect to quality <coughs> I mean, that second point went to competitive incentives or bypass incentives. The third point is that we have in the past and we can in the future monitor uh, questions r relating to quality. 
The last point I would make uh, with respect to uh, technological investments is uh, I, I disagree. I think a rate cap environment uh, is an environment in which uh, companies would be even more so incented uh, to invest in technological improvements that increase demand for their services and increase utilization of the networks. And the reason is very simple, that they have some possibility of uh, increasing the uh, uh, the entrepreneurial profit earned by those companies below the cap. So I believe that neither quality nor technological uh, investment is going to suffer in this new environment. I think technological investment will be improved, in fact, but it is an issue. We're looking at it in the docket, and uh, we stand ready to monitor if that's uh, the Let me just move down very quickly. Commissioner Dennison and Commissioner Dawson, can you comment to Commissioner Dennison, and then we'll go to Commissioner Dawson. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have... Uh, publicly stated my concern about uh, the po potential for the degradation of service quality. And the only thing that I would add to what Chairman Patrick has said, that I know that there's uh, Section 214D of the Act, which enables the FCC to force carriers to provide <coughs> adequate services. And um, because of that, I think that we have at least a mechanism uh, to ensure that quality is not degraded. Okay. Commissioner Dawson? Well, I would like to just echo that. Um, I've not always um, thought that the Commission had the necessary resources to, uh, to do uh, many of the um, things that we needed to do. This is one area, however, I think we have an excellent record. Post-divestiture, where there was service delays and some severe problems and dislocations caused, the Commission has a terrific record in that area of working with carriers um, to deliver the uh, quality of service that they were intended to provide. And I don't think that anyone is suggesting that the commitment to that quality of service would be lessened by this, nor our authority to make sure that it happens. Great. My time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. I'll again. You know, as I as I listen to this debate, <coughs> I hear the term price cap. It sounds to me like price controls, <coughs> and. Uh, then I hear uh, other terms like freeze. And I think to myself, my gosh, here's our chairman, who uh, he and I have kind of differed over the years on things like price controls and freezes. And uh, this time, there's a, a bit of a, a different role being played. Um, but I'd like to, to uh, talk about that idea of price <laughs> controls or price caps. Uh, we, we, we are told that uh, the cost of rate-based rate regulation is at a billion dollars um, and that uh, there's massive paperwork, and I know of a particular case where one rate reduction effort on the part of the leading player here uh, took a stack of papers four feet high. This is to gain a rate reduction. So, you know, we would look towards paperwork reduction. But uh, price caps could conceivably, if it was every rate, if it was uh, every uh, possible situation and every carrier, uh, it, it could be very much a complicated system and would defeat the purpose of changing from one system to the other. And uh, I guess um, I, I would like uh, to hear your comments, Mr. Chairman, uh, Patrick, uh, about how you would envision a, a regulatory apparatus that did indeed uh, markedly lower paperwork and the regulatory burden of uh, such a new system. Well, Congressman uh, Ritter, I, I think uh, If I might just interject, oh, I'm when sorry. we had the oil price controls, you, you, know, you know how the enormous amount of paperwork that went into that system, and, and it turned out that those price caps ended up, price controls, I'm sorry, ended up being not, a, not necessarily a ceiling, but a floor. And when we decontrolled, the price of oil uh, fell. So uh, could I have your comments? And uh, Secretary Sykes as well, I think. Commissioners, uh, if they would. Yes, sir. Let me just comment uh, briefly by saying that the administrative cost question uh, is an important question, and it's part, part of this e equation. 
the to me the the larger question and the more important question is whether or not we can dramatically improve the incentive structure so as to benefit consumers um, that having been said with respect to the uh, the regulatory or administrative uh, question uh, we have to entertain uh, tariffs on every service now um, if we uh, uh, went initially to a very conservative uh, price cap regime in which we capped uh, 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 services individually, service by service, and capped all services. Uh, and the notice of proposed rulemaking really errs on the side of conservatism in that regard. Uh, we would be no worse off in terms of, uh, uh, of having uh, prices or, or tariffing issues uh, related to each of those services, but we would be uh, better off in the sense that the cap uh, contemplates flexibility, a great deal of flexibility below the cap, not above the cap, but below the cap. And so there would be some, some gain in that regard. We have proposed to streamline our consideration uh, of a, a tariff filing in a cap environment that proposes a price below the, below the cap. So there would be some gains uh, there, um, uh, which, which obviously would be, uh, would be beneficial. Um, <coughs> lastly, let me just say that uh, with respect to your uh, comments on the, the oil industry, one of the upsides, uh, well, I shouldn't use that term, it confuses the issue, but one of the potential advantages uh, of the rate cap regime is precisely that of providing flexibility below the cap because we would like to see prices uh, fall and, and more closely approximate costs because that's what we're in the business of doing is ensuring that consumers don't have to pay uh, any more than they should have to pay uh, for services. So that sort of uh, phenomenon is something we'd like to see, and I think it will be facilitated by uh, price caps. Secretary Sachs. Well, I'm not sure I can improve on the chairman's uh, response with respect to transitioning to a price cap uh, uh, regime where that's necessary. But, but, you know, what has not been discussed to this point, at least, is competition. And the fact that fundamental to the American enterprise system is that competition is what produces price close to cost and what produces quality in service and what produces innovation in service. And we have a great deal of competition in the inter-exchange market. And in my uh, view, that competition is going to serve us in respect to both the price level uh, and the service level. And it is in maintaining that competition that I think the scarce resources that uh, the, the chairman has commented on and that others have commented on uh, need to be directed. Uh, if, if there is uh, a charge of predatory pricing, let's look at it so that uh, we do not allow predatory pricing to undermine the competitive environment. If there's a charge that the equal access obligations are not being maintained, let's look at that so we don't let the failure to meet the equal access obligations undermine a competitive environment. But if we keep the inter-exchange environment competitive, then it's going to be MCI and U.S. Sprint and a variety of others that keep AT&T in tow. Uh, and, and, you know, my own view is that government is the last uh, 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 place that we should look to for making sure that price stays close to cost. The Maryland example earlier used is, is underscores how bogus rate of return regulation is. I would bet my last dollar that the price that was capped was a price established under rate of return regulation and it was within that price structure that the so-called super profit was allowed. Yeah, I, I have also one other comment. Uh, Mr. Sinar was talking about the number of auditors uh, necessary to carry this whole situation out. And, and uh, if, if, again, the regulatory scheme was uh, far more detailed and, uh, and if the pressures were there to track far more information and if the system of competition didn't itself work, uh, you might need more many, many, many more auditors. But isn't the whole idea of going to some kind of price cap versus rate base uh, regulation, rate, rate of return regulation, to simplify the, the regulatory environment so as perhaps to make the uh, teams, the numbers of auditors uh, <coughs> fewer? Absolutely. I mean, I, I would say that there, you know, whether it's 15 or 18 or 50, there will never be a point of happiness. There, there will never be a point of contentment. Uh, but, but if we have for the services that are not uh, uh, competitively offered a price cap, uh, then we remove the incentive for cost shifting. 
and, and that would be uh, uh, an immeasurably uh, constructive reform uh, in this dynamic sector. Uh, and, and, you know, as we find more and more occasions, I think, where regulated companies are getting into unregulated businesses, uh, I really think the price cap regulation uh, approach, both at the state and the federal level, needs to be accelerated. Chairman Patrick, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I would uh, just comment by, uh, by saying, as I did earlier, that the point you make about uh, administration, uh, administrative costs, and the, the degree of regulation is an important point, and it's part of this equation. I guess I would rank it uh, ab about third in terms of the public interest considerations that drive uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Rank it about third among the considerations that uh, that uh, drive uh, our interest in caps. I think first, it's very important for us to change the incentive structure because I think the American people will be better off in the long run if we have uh, positive incentives rather than incentives to cross subsidize and inflate the rate base. Secondly, uh, I think that more flexibility below the cap is the type of thing that facilitates competition, uh, and that's uh, that's positive, especially in the interexchange uh, market. And third, there are administrative cost or administrative uh, gains to be uh, to be made. But I think the important point is the uh, is the incentive uh, piece. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Leland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Patrick. Uh, You've repeatedly mentioned the perverse incentives of rate of return regulation to inflate rate base and cross subsidize. Can't these perverse incentives be corrected by more responsible and careful regulation, such as structural separation, increased access to affiliate books and records, and longer time periods to examine a rate increase request? <coughs> Congressman Leland. Uh, uh, your question really goes to the relationship between the two uh, the two topics that uh, we are uh, we have at issue uh, uh, here this morning. The question of the commission's uh, efforts uh, to deal with cross subsidies in the context of the GAO report, and the question of price caps. <coughs> the answer to your question, I think, is that yes, we can do better, and I think we have done better uh, in providing for a system of non-structural safeguards that will protect consumers. Uh, better and more effectively from cross subsidies uh, and ensure that competition is fair. But that fails to convince me that we ought to have at the same time a system of regulating uh, prices or tariffs uh, uh, in this market uh, that are antithetical to that result that cause our problems in the cross subsidy area to be, uh, to be even uh, more uh, uh, pronounced. I think that in fact what we should do uh, is continue to ensure that we have adequate safeguards, but at the same time put into effect a regulatory structure that will create positive incentives and will eliminate the incentive to cross-subsidize. Uh, if, in fact, uh, the, the concerns uh, of the committee are, are well-founded with respect to our resources in dealing with cross-subsidies, then I would say help us out uh, by helping us to move to uh, an environment that will reinforce uh, uh, our ability to deal with cross subsidies rather than be antagonistic to that result. For the record, why, why not just uh, simply refine the rate of return regulation instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater? I think, uh, uh, Congressman, that rate of return uh, regulation is inherently flawed. Uh, I think that uh, maybe in this case it is the baby that needs to be tossed out the window. Oh. Uh, that sounds a little harsh, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is. Rate of return regulation is inherently flawed. Uh, I, we can improve it on the margin. I think we haven't improved it on the margin with respect to, for instance, uh, the, uh, the cross-subsidy uh, uh, question. Uh, but if you have a cost-plus contract uh, with a telephone company, you are creating a situation in which uh, there is an incentive to inflate the rate base because that is the only way uh, to increase dollar earnings. Uh, and if you have a cost-plus con uh, contract uh, with these companies, it is rational. It is not proper, and we will try to detect it, uh, but it is rational as an economic matter for them to try to take one dollar from the competitive side and put it on the regulated side because we say to them in turn, uh, we're going to cover that dollar and give you 12 or 12.2 percent over and above it. That's rational conduct. Um, those are inherent to a rate of return regime uh, in my view. Uh, there is no incentive in rate of return to, uh, to economize and cut costs. If the FCC the next year is going to take all of the profits that you have earned by skill, industry, and foresight, uh, 
uh, there is no incentive to innovate if innovate is innovation is going to vastly expand demand, and that demand is going to uh, increase your rate of return, and we're going to turn right around and take away uh, that uh, uh, those uh, or that rate of return the next year. So the answer to your question is we can improve it on the margin, but it's inherently flawed. And I withdraw the comment about throwing the baby out. It was, uh, I feel guilty about that, actually. What, 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 what you should do is say that you're really sorry that you made that statement. You, don't <laughs> <laughs> you didn't really mean that. I you? didn't mean it. I okay. Strike that from the record. Can we do that? Let's do that in depositions. <clears throat> uh, without objection, I would ask that the, that the statement be withdrawn from the record. <laughs> Not from television, though. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Patrick, uh, does the FCC, and maybe I missed your response to the same question, I'm not sure if it was asked, but does the FCC have a written strategic plan as to how it will accomplish its oversight function through accounting and cost allocation uh, plans? Yes, let me uh, have, uh, we did talk a little bit about that earlier, um, and let me have Jerry Brock, our uh, Chief of the Common Carrier Bureau, uh, uh, who is uh, dealing very uh, intimately with uh, this, uh, this accounting question day to day, respond to that. But let me respond in a general way, uh, first by saying that there has been a great deal of focus uh, on the audit capacity of the FCC, and this was the thrust of the GAO report, and I agree. Uh, that the uh, capacity of the FCC in terms of conducting our own independent <coughs> audits uh, is very important. But I do not think our capacity to uh, deal with the uh, cross-subsidy problem can be appropriately analyzed without reference to all of the pieces that we have put into place with respect to uh, 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 dealing with this cross-subsidy problem. And they include, just quickly, the fact that we have uh, for the first time articulated standards in the context of Docket 86.111 for the first time, which deal generically and across the board with a matter of separating regulated and unregulated costs. And I might say that those rules err on the side of allocating costs to the non-regulated side of the aisle to protect ratepayers. We are now reviewing manuals that have been filed by all of the companies for the first time, putting into, uh, in this context, uh, putting into place for that company those principles which the Commission has articulated. We have reporting requirements whereby uh, these companies are going to have to file data with uh, the Commission, both on an annual and a quarterly basis. And for the first time, as of January 1st, 1988, we're going to deal with that data by and through an integrated uh, a data system, the ARMIS system, our uh, automatic reporting management information system, which includes hardware and software. And it's important because we are going to have, for the first time, all of this data from the companies inputted in a consistent format, which will allow <coughs> us to compare companies over time, compare one company against another, uh, look at a, the contrast between what was projected and what actually happened, uh, all of it through this system, again, for the first time. The independent audits, have been, it has been suggested that uh, they're less than useful. I quite disagree. We have, a, we have reversed part of the burden, not all of the burden, uh, but part of the burden to the companies and said to them, if you want to get into uh, non-regulated activities, one of the conditions preceding is that you undergo an independent audit that will provide positive assurance that you are in fact complying uh, with the FCC's rules. But we don't stop there. We also have an FCC audit ca uh, capability, which I have made a personal commitment to uh, ensure is adequate and is funded. And if Jerry has something to add to that, uh, <laughs> it would surprise me, but let's see. I, I don't have anything to add to the, the substance. We do not have, in, in your actual question, was do we have a specific written plan laying out all of these things? As the chairman has indicated, we do have a very definite plan. It's not one that's written down and made public at the moment. It's more of various internal planning memos for exactly how we will accomplish the various tasks. And gentlemen, you will be glad to yield. You have a very specific plan, but it's not written down yet? Is that what you just said? I said it's not written down as a single plan for all of these different things and released to the public. We have individual memos for approval of various specific parts of it. I, I mean, a, pl a plan kind of implies that it's integrated and you know, well structured. It's Otherwise, you you know, you kind of like think it's like a secret plan. You know, and <laughs> and we've heard that before someplace. And and uh, we would just like to know that there was something that was more concrete and well integrated. So I thank the gentleman. Yeah. Let me. Is it, is it possible? Oh, could, could we be made uh, 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 
could we be given the plans that you, that you have so far just through memo? You don't have, you know, however uh, disconcerted the plan might be. Uh, Absolutely, Congressman. We will we'll provide you with uh, uh, as detailed a, a description of uh, our non-structural safeguard uh, plan as you would like. And let me clarify what uh, uh, what was suggested. I think all that uh, Jerry was uh, suggesting is that I can think uh, of, off the top of my head, no single piece of paper wherein we have stapled together a description of each one of the five uh, uh, plans that I just described for you. But we can certainly do that, and we will provide it for you. We do, in fact, have a plan, and it is public. It is not a secret plan. I just laid it out. I understand, and I appreciate that it's not a secret plan. We would appreciate uh, all of the information that you have to be made available to the committee. Let me just ask you, and I know that I, my time has run out, uh, maybe Mr. Brock would like to answer this. Does the plan include such items as staff utilization, a schedule of audits and field travel, a <coughs> mythology for a review of CPA audits, a schedule and mythology for automated reporting and analysis, criteria for selection of areas for staff audit attention, coordination with other regulatory staff such as tariff division and assignment of responsibility for each task force, or each task rather. It does include uh, a, a very detailed plan for our automated reporting system, including schedules of when each part of it will be implemented, when each piece of equipment will come, when <coughs> each kind of report will be defined. It includes uh, extensive effort on the coordination with the tariff division. Uh, it includes, in a general way, our allocation of individual audit resources. I might say that the <coughs> reason we do not make that quite so specific is that exactly where I send an auditor will depend upon what kind of information is discovered. And I would certainly not want to lay out a plan that said, uh, uh, Bell Atlantic, you know that you won't see an auditor uh, this year or until this month and you have your opportunity to uh, uh, do whatever you want. We will send auditors at, at any time on a ran somewhat randomized basis and sometimes in direct response to information that we receive through outside audits or other information that we have. Mr. Chairman, I have other questions that I'd like to submit uh, in writing to the panel. Okay, great. The, the uh, gentleman's you. time has expired and the gentleman's questions will be posed to the commission with their requests that they uh, respond to them in writing. I know that Commissioner Dawson uh, has to leave at this time and I just wanted one more time just to thank her for her service on the commission. She has been um, absolutely splendid in her service and I have very much um, in fact admired her contributions and I want to one more time just uh, compliment you on and Thank give you, you all the best wishes of our committee. Thank you. Thank you for your patience for allowing me to leave early. I'm sure the uh, price cap issue is in good hands here between the everyone involved. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an opening statement I'd like to ask unanimous consent to be made part of the record. Without objection, it will be included in the record at the appropriate point. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Ohio once again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as uh, <coughs> many of you, I'm sure, know, many states have looked into this uh, cap uh, situation. And uh, in Ohio, for example, my home state, there's been legislation introduced uh, that would be uh, somewhat along the same lines as the FCC is exploring in terms of providing for uh, alternate forms of regulation that promote efficiency and effectiveness uh, and uh, at the same time protect the consumers and make uh, prices uh, more competitive. Uh, the uh, bill was introduced in July of this year and there have been uh, hearings in the subcommittee. Matter of fact, the subcommittee is being chaired by a state representative from my own uh, district and um, this would limit the basic telephone charges uh, to uh, the increases in the annual change in the CPI. Uh, to what extent uh, is the well, first of all, let me back up. Uh, there have been a lot of people who say, well, the states are really the laboratory of laboratories of government and that, uh, indeed, in many cases, uh, some of the breakthroughs that have occurred at the federal level first started with the states. Uh, is that a fair assumption? And if indeed that is, uh, are we better to wait for the states to uh, implement this kind of uh, cost uh, uh, basis for a telephone service, or should, in fact, the FCC continue on their efforts at the federal level. Uh, Chairman Patrick, let's start with you. 
Congressman, I, I think that in the, uh, in the area of re-examining the public interest utility of rate of return regulation, the federal jurisdiction is on the lagging edge. In fact, 31 different states have moved away from rate of return uh, regulation in, in some regard. They have recognized uh, the points that we have, we have made here this morning about the uh, uh, perverse incentives that are created by a rate of return regime, and they are uh, uh, altering uh, their schemes uh, accordingly. Whether or not uh, we should uh, uh, wait and, and, and determine how uh, those uh, uh, processes uh, have worked out, um, I think it is, uh, I don't think so. I think it is an appropriate time uh, for the Commission to be exploring uh, alternatives to rate of return regulation uh, at the federal level uh, right now. There is a wide body uh, of knowledge and, in fact, a general consensus uh, that rate of return uh, uh, regulation is, is flawed. And I think it's high time that we explore uh, uh, ways in which we can uh, promote uh, uh, the con uh, consumer welfare even more effectively. Mr. Sykes? Yes, let me first comment that the British have been using uh, a price cap approach toward uh, regulation for now almost three years. And so not only can we look to what's happening in some states, but we can likewise uh, look to what's happening in the United Kingdom. Uh, secondly, uh, I think one of the uh, important reasons to uh, speed this docket, and in my opening statement I indicated go further than the FCC is now prepared to go, is because there is a great deal of, of, of diversification occurring in the telephone industry. As that diversification occurs, it does raise the uh, potential for more and more cross-subsidization. Uh, the price cap uh, uh, regulatory approach would, uh, I think, eliminate uh, uh, the cost shifting. Uh, thirdly, uh, and, and, and while this might seem not quite so important in the telephone industry where uh, we are not competing with, uh, with foreign providers, uh, I nonetheless believe the telephone uh, industry uh, has the sort of technology that's really leveraged technology that is so crucial uh, to this country's uh, competition uh, in, in a global context. And I think we've got to enhance productivity uh, in this sector. And I think, uh, again, in inter-exchange, uh, there is no need for price cap regulation, but in other areas, price cap regulation will, uh, in fact, increase productivity. The um it appears to me from just what I've read uh, about the hearings that took place in Ohio, for example, there are two basic groups that have some concern about changing this system. Uh, the first group appears to be uh, service uh, industries, uh, realtors, uh, people that use the telephone uh, quite a bit in their, in their everyday uh, work. And the other one would be, I guess, uh, rural uh, folks who are concerned that the change uh, would indeed leave them uh, somewhat behind in, in terms of uh, keeping a, a reasonable rate of re, uh, a reasonable rate for their uh, telephone service. Uh, could you address yourself to those uh, uh, problems or potential problems that have been raised uh, at least in Ohio at the hearing level? Uh, yes, sir. I think the the short answer is that we envision a scheme that would cause all consumers to be uh, to be better off, specifically with the question of uh, uh, rural Americans uh, or those uh, individuals whose telephone service is in some sense subsidized by and through a high cost fund uh, or other mechanism. Uh, one of the things we are looking at uh, in the notice is how, will we, how we will maintain that level of subsidy so that there will be uh, uh, no injury whatsoever to uh, uh, rural individuals, uh, uh, no adverse impact upon pooling uh, of revenues that are used uh, for various uh, subsidies. Uh, so we are, we are on top of that issue, and uh, we would not allow uh, any uh, individuals in those uh, various situations uh, to suffer by and through this uh, rate cap proposal. And in fact, what I, would, what I would argue is that those individuals stand to be better off, uh, the reason uh, being in a very, in a competitive marketplace, the place that the competition uh, uh, comes to fruition uh, first and uh, is most manifest is in the so-called high end of the market. Um, one of the things that attracts uh, me to the rate cap proposal is that we're creating or we would create an incentive that would go across the board. Any place a company can save uh, a dollar, it has an incentive uh, to do so. And that sort of focus upon becoming more efficient across the board 
is something that uh, I think will benefit uh, consumers who maybe have not had a chance to participate so much in the, the evolution of competition. Rate averaging is, uh, is implicated by your question, and let me say that we have no intention of moving away from rate averaging by and, by and through this docket. Thank you. The, uh, your comment in regards to 31 states, you didn't mean to imply <coughs> that 31 states had gone to the uh, rate cap, had, did you? No, absolutely not. And if I did, uh, I stand corrected. I think what I said, what I intended to say was that 31 states uh, had uh, uh, moved away from rate of return in some way. The various methodologies that they have employed, I'm sure, differ from state to state. In your uh, knowledge, uh, if you know, what state or, or group of states have gone the furthest away from the old system and towards a, a different uh, type of system, and what does that entail? If Mr. Brock could help us there, I'd yes. appreciate it. Uh, <coughs> our information at present is that in 12 states w have actually removed rate of return regulation, uh, and 14 more states have maintained rate of return regulation but introduced some type of pricing flexibility for various services. Uh, and then there were five additional states that have made less significant changes. That adds up to the 31 that the chairman mentioned. Uh, the, just as, as the kind of thing, I think the uh, good examples would be uh, that in Virginia, uh, all intrastate long distance services have been deregulated. That's the uh, sort of the ultimate form of removing rate of return regulation is to no regulation at all. Uh, in Virginia's comments with us, they seem to be very satisfied with that. In uh, New York uh, is one example, uh, as well as Ohio, where there have been some significant changes in regulation, but not to the point of removing rate of return regulation or going to a price cap approach. And those were initiated by the, by the state legislatures or by the PUCs or in, acting in concert? Do you know how that? In, in a variety of different ways. Uh, I don't have, a, at the moment, a rundown of exactly how each one occurred. I know in many cases the, uh, the, the actual removal of rate of return required some type of legislative action. Generally, a state PUC is authorized to make some adjustments as to how flexibly they apply it. Thank you. Ms. Sykes? I might just say that former Governor Kerry, uh, again a Democratic governor from Nebraska, has been in the forefront of leading uh, uh, reform of telecommunications regulation, or actually deregulation in many respects, and that uh, he has had this as a, uh, as a focal uh, point uh, at a number of uh, governor's conferences, uh, and that uh, it's frequently been the political leadership that has led uh, the, the reform efforts, and in the 12 states that were cited, about half of them uh, dropped regulation for competitively offered services altogether, did not go to a price cap regime. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cook. I thank the chair. I appreciated hearing Chairman Fowler, or Chairman Patrick, excuse me, earlier comments about how he was going to take care of rural uh, telephone companies. As the gentleman is aware, I probably have more small telephone companies, co-ops in my district than perhaps any other member. I wanted to make sure that I had a clear understanding. I thought that Chairman Patrick said that uh, he uh, did not intend that there be any adverse impact on the CCL pooling fund as a result of his price cap proposal. Is that correct? That's correct. And I interpret that to mean you don't want any negative effect on rural telephone companies or rural customers as a result of this proposal. Yeah, that, that's correct, Congressman. One of the, one of the issues uh, that we have explicitly uh, uh, recognized uh, in the docket are implementational issues, and one of the issues that falls under that uh, category are uh, potential impacts upon pooling. Uh, which uh, companies, as you know, uh, sometimes rely on, do rely on for various subsidies. And it's very important to me, important to the Commission, that, uh, uh, that this proposal have no adverse uh, impact upon uh, rural Americans. And as I said before, not only will, will there be no adverse impact, I think they will benefit. So you're on record as supporting the maintenance of all existing subsidies that are involved in that pooling process? Well, now, <laughs> that's... that's that's a slightly uh, uh, different question. Uh, one of the issues 
that we are focusing upon in this docket is the impact uh, of rate caps uh, on uh, things like pooling uh, on subsidy questions. And I would not uh, want a rate cap proposal to have any uh, adverse uh, impact upon uh, necessary uh, subsidies that we have crafted by and through those mechanisms. When you start talking about on record generally any impact, I have no idea what that might entail and therefore I'm indisposed to say yes. If, if, so I, I, may, if, if I may just add one further comment to that. The, the two primary ways by which we protect rural America right now are the pooling uh, that's done for the CCL pool and the requirement for, uh, for geographically average rates in the long distance schedule. And neither of those are at any direct issue in this particular proceeding. Mm -hmm. But while your intentions, I think, are clear on the record that you do not want any adverse impact, so far we have no specific means of assuring that there would be no adverse impact, right? We're just talking your intentions. We don't have any plan to guarantee that your intentions will be fulfilled. Well, Congressman, uh, that's why we conduct notice and comment proceedings. I might note that the reply comments haven't even been filed in this docket, uh, and we have every expectation that those reply comments are going to be extensive and are going to deal with, uh, uh, with the issues that we framed in the notice, and among them are these, these issues. So it, is, it would be a premature for me to lay out uh, all of the details of the plan whereby we ensure that there I is no material adverse uh, impact. I understand that it is early, but it still seems to me there's some obligation on the part of the FCC with these very pure intentions to have offered a plan that could at least in theory protect the interest of the rural consumer. And yeah. I'm sure that you have a plan that in theory protects the interest of the rural consumer. That's correct. I think that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. But because we are sensitive to this issue, we are uh, d engaging the issue explicitly in the context uh, of the notice. But I think that the, the plan is, in fact, uh, consistent with our interest. Can you speculate how important protecting the rural consumer will be to you when you make final decisions? Is it a deal breaker if there's some <coughs> harm that's meted out to the rural telephone consumer? Or is it something that you'll... Uh, that will break, break any proposal that you've got. Uh, Congressman, I think that uh, when we set up the actual plan, the, the final plan, whatever we adopt, uh, we will be extraordinarily sensitive to these various kinds of concerns. And as the chairman indicated, it is our intention to create a plan that benefits everyone, uh, all classes of consumers, and is, is more efficient for the overall economy. Uh, it's my job to craft the details to make them conform to uh, his broad goals, and I have confidence that uh, my staff and I will be able to do so. Well, I like the lip service of benefiting everyone and taking care of everyone. It just worries me that sensitivity hasn't been shown in the past. For example, on the subscriber line charge issue, is it your view that rural telephone consumers have been helped or at least haven't been harmed as a result of the imposition of those subscriber line charges? <coughs> Is well, that proof of your concern of the welfare of rural telephone consumers? Cong Congressman, uh, no one uh, that I'm aware of uh, <coughs> is uh, uh, is excited about or, or generally enjoys uh, receiving uh, a, an extra $2.60 uh, or reflected uh, upon their local bill. Uh, and I think that the reaction uh, uh, in, in that regard uh, is similar in urban areas uh, to rural areas. However, uh, the answer to your question is yes. I think overall and in the long run, all Americans have, have benefited uh, by and through the subscriber line uh, charge program uh, because we think that uh, it is efficiency enhancing and we think that it has helped uh, to uh, uh, thwart a bypass and with respect to the bypass threat, let me say that it is your rural constituents who, s who stand uh, in a position to lose the most uh, if there is uh, a massive amounts uh, of bypass, uh, given the fact that they are supporting uh, a very large amount of fixed costs and they need all of the revenues <coughs> they could get to take some of those fixed costs off their shoulders. And it is precisely that concern which, uh, which caused the Commission uh, to move in the direction of a certain uh, amount of subscriber line charges.
perhaps I should invite you to my district so that you can personally explain to my constituents, many of whom never make a long distance phone call, <coughs> how the subscriber line charge is helping their situation. On the toll rate uh, averaging issue, just to again make it perfectly clear, you have no intention whatsoever of changing the uh, geographic toll rate averaging policy. That's correct, <coughs> Congressman. How about the impact of price cap proposals on small telephone companies as opposed to large ones? Do you feel that the impact will be relatively the same on each type of telephone company? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's something that we are currently examining uh, and receiving comments. So far, both large and small telephone companies in general have expressed uh, favorable reactions toward the proposal. Uh, it is we have made no decision at the moment of, of whether to go forward at all and certainly not as to exactly which companies would be incorporated into any final proposal. As the chairman mentioned, we're still receiving comments on our proposal and trying to clarify uh, what its impact would be in among various classes of both consumers and businesses. Mm -hmm. Congressman, what? if I just, yes. if I might add to that, uh, uh, that the rate of return regime that we have today varies in certain regards uh, uh, in its application to uh, to various companies, small companies as distinguished from larger companies. And I have in mind, of course, certain administrative distinctions and uh, average schedule companies uh, for interest. So I think that's a legitimate issue, and it's one of the ones that we're going to have to think about very carefully as we uh, as we uh, analyze the comments. Your intention in this area is to protect small companies as well as large ones. It, it is, and we have shown a great deal of concern for small companies. Uh, I might mention in that respect that in some ways the smallest companies already have uh, a system that, that bears certain similarities to price caps through our <coughs> average schedule arrangement. And it's uh, by no means the entire price cap proposal, but it does <coughs> cut the tie between their own cost and the particular rate they're allowed to use. That seems to have been an effective protection for the small companies in the past. My time has expired. Thank you. <laughs> Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to commend uh, Commissioner Dennis uh, for a speech that she gave uh, recently on October 6th in which it seems that uh, there's one commissioner who has become liberated from the Chicago School of Economics of the commission. In other words, there is an independent voice in the commission. And I'm going to read uh, what Commissioner Dennis uh, said in that speech, and then I'm going to ask her to amplify. If the carrier's overall earnings far exceed the return on investments in other enterprises having corresponding risk, does this mean that the Commission is obligated to reduce the carrier's rates? If the Commission does have such an obligation, how can we carry out this task? Are there other public interest factors which might nonetheless justify generous returns on investment that might result under price caps? Looking at the other side of the co coin, assume that through no fault of its own, a carrier's costs rise dramatically, perhaps because of a sudden and unexpected rise in interest rates, when that carrier needed to incur a substantial amount of debt. Under such circumstances, is it fair to hold a carrier to its capped rates? Perhaps more importantly, it may be an unconstitutional confiscation of the carrier's property if a regulatory agency does not permit the carrier to recover from its ratepayers the unexpectedly increased cost. Now, before stressing that, that I have made a definitive uh, position on this issue, let me just say that I think the Commissioner raises some important points, and I wish to commend you for them and wonder if you'd like to just expand on on those statements that you made uh, in that speech. I thought I might be hearing from you, Congressman. <laughs> um, first of all, that issue uh, which you uh, quoted from my speech is really one that com uh, Chairman Patrick has alluded to earlier today, and that is that we have an obligation to ensure that carrier rates fall within a zone of reasonableness. And therefore, it is for that reason that we at the Commission, I think, and it's evidenced in the NPRM, are uh, concerned that we keep both an upside and a downside uh, uh, view uh, to allow for adjustments on both the upside and the downside should uh, we decide that indeed price caps are a good option. 
Um, <clears throat> and obviously the, the concern is that ratepayers should benefit from cost reductions that are attributable to labor savings and other kinds of factors such as tax law changes, et cetera, and that shareholders should be kept told in the event of a major cost increase so that we do not uh, have confiscatory rates, which the chairman has identified earlier. Um, also, I, we are concerned, and we put a footnote in the NPRM about the possibility of excessive carrier earnings over time. And uh, footnote 88 talks about um, uh, unreasonably high excessive carrier earnings and that w indeed we would have to take extraordinary measures to uh, investigate those. And finally, uh, one of my concerns, and I think it is shared universally by the commissioners, is that uh, we have to ensure that with uh, price caps that it is at least as efficient and uh, no more costly than rate of return and maintaining rates within the zone of reasonableness because that is our, our uh, mandate under the Communications Act. Well, Commissioner, I want to commend you for uh, this breath of uh, fresh air, and I hope that uh, we don't have these unanimous decisions coming out of the Commission, and I hope you occasionally provide that uh, different point of view. I'm just talking in general, not specifically in this issue. Uh, Commissioner Patrick, I have two questions, and I know the CPI issue was raised before. And while there was criticism of the CPI index, which uh, it seems to me that uh, if you look at the statistics in the last 10 years, long distance costs have declined 18 percent, while the CPI has increased almost 94 uh, percent. It's, it's, I think, accurate to criticize the CPI, but uh, I guess my question is, uh, is there any other barometer that could be used? Is there any other option? Uh, is there any other rate structure that might be considered? And I guess my second question, uh, playing the, the devil's advocates, if we're talking about present services falling uh, under rate caps, what about new services? How will prices be set? What will stop the service providers from existing uh, from slightly changing existing services and saying, well, these are new. Uh, how, would you, how would you deal with those two? And yes, sir, Congressman. Uh, as your first question on the consumer price index, uh, that is uh, one of a number of uh, a possible uh, uh, pieces of information or, or mechanisms to adjust the cap over time, and we haven't made any uh, definitive decisions uh, in that regard. I might uh, point out, however, that uh, consumer price index or some measure of the value of money is something that is incorporated into our rate of return uh, uh, methodology uh, uh, today. So it is really uh, nothing, uh, nothing new. Uh, the, the fact that we have had declining uh, costs uh, despite uh, some measure of inflation uh, is an indication of a number of things, one of which is that uh, productivity has, out, has outstripped that countervailing force uh, of inflation. But again, all of that is, uh, is old news because that's a phenomenon that uh, exists today in the, in the rate of return uh, environment. Uh, number two, are there other uh, possibilities? Yes, there are a number of other possibilities. Uh, uh, there are various ways to measure the, the, the value of money, uh, the cost of money, uh, producer price in indices. Uh, NTIA has suggested uh, a different uh, uh, a possible uh, mechanism to adjust the cap uh, over time, which would uh, focus uh, a little bit more narrowly on the telecommunications industry as distinguished from one particular company. Which is, uh, which is an idea well worth uh, exploring. And, and we have not reached any definitive conclusions uh, in these regards. Third question on the uh, uh, new services. Uh, that, that is a very good question and a very good issue, one that we have uh, thought about uh, quite a bit, and it's explicitly uh, addressed uh, in, in the notice. Um, we have indicated our uh, uh, presumptive or tentative view that we should cap uh, the price of new services. And one of the reasons for that is that we would not want to uh, uh, get into a situation uh, in which uh, a service was slightly altered in order to escape uh, the cap, or at least that's one of the concerns that we put into that equation. Uh, how we set uh, the initial uh, uh, cap or the initial price uh, is an issue we also uh, address in the notice, and it would obviously, in the initial instance, have, have something to do with cost. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas is recognized, Mr. Field. Chairman Patrick, uh, you said that one of the real pluses of the price cap tool is the ability to move carriers to minimize their cost. So the question is, if, if A&T is under some type of 
price cap uh, it will have added incentives to cut cost would that move them towards some type of uh, bypass alternative and if so uh, what effect would bypass have on the overall system well, that's uh, another issue that we've given, given some thought to and will give more thought to. It is one of the concerns of the uh, local exchange uh, uh, companies, and I think uh, a bypass uh, is, is always a legitimate concern. So we're going to look at that very, uh, very carefully. The answer to your question in general terms uh, is that a rate cap uh, regime uh, would give increased incentives to cut costs, and that is generally uh, consumer welfare enhancing. That's generally positive. We want to applaud and endorse that. Uh, uh, and that, that, however, uh, will result in uh, that company being disposed to avoid unnecessary costs. Uh, and uh, therefore, it may be relevant to the bypass question. And all I can tell you at this point is that uh, that's an argument that's being made uh, very strenuously by the local exchange companies, and we're going to look at it very carefully. Well, but revisiting the same question, what would that do if, in fact, it did move AT&T to greater bypass? I mean, what effect would that have on the overall system? Any increase in bypass would be detrimental to our carrier common line pool, though we think that with the current schedule of implementation of subscriber line charge that we have probably taken care of enough of the bypass concerns that that we will be all right. Uh, we, have, we have accepted the fact already that even under rate of return regulation, uh, there is some incentive uh, for bypass either from private users uh, or from companies other than AT&T who are not so tightly regulated and to some extent from AT&T as well. But as the chairman indicated, we are uh, examining this kind of question closely in this proceeding. Well, and uh, given that uh, it seems that the central focus of this price cap issue is the increase of efficiency, the cost savings, uh, so forth and so on, wouldn't the cost caps be appropriate for a local exchange company as well as AT&T? Well, that is certainly uh, an issue that we have put on the table. Uh, our uh, proposal goes to any dominant carrier, AT&T and, uh, and the LECs. We have noted uh, in the item that there may be certain uh, uh, different uh, implementational issues to be engaged in the, in the case of uh, the LECs. Uh, but uh, we believe in general that the potential benefits, which you identify in your question, are benefits that are uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, to be realized uh, both from, from any dominant carrier, both uh, AT&T uh, uh, and the LECs. Well, what would be some of those uh, implementational issues? Well, uh, a num one of the, uh, the issues or something we would want to keep in mind was, uh, was identified uh, earlier and discussed uh, earlier with Congressman Cooper. Uh, I would want to ensure that, uh, uh, that the rate cap proposal had no adverse impact uh, on pooling. Um, I think we would have to think about uh, the, uh, the impact of a rate cap proposal, uh, maybe more specifically the productivity index on uh, companies of different sizes. I have in mind a, a small local exchange company uh, that might find it uh, uh, difficult uh, to uh, deal with a productivity in index which uh, was geared to uh, an industry-wide uh, uh, standard. Issues uh, such as that. And there are a number of other issues that are identified in the notice. If I may add, it's simply the fact that there are 1,400 local exchange companies of extraordinarily widely varying size and, and uh, demographics that they serve and so forth uh, are what generate the implementation difficulties there. Well, I guess the point I was, I was trying to drive at, if the LECs had the same incentives and flexibility that uh, perhaps they would better be able to respond to any changes. Uh, that would occur from a pi price cap being placed on AT&T. One final question, uh, what factors would affect the cap, uh, either up or down over a period of time? There are uh, a number of uh, potential factors, and we have not reached any, uh, any final conclusions with respect to uh, how the uh, cap ought to be uh, structured. Uh, but among the, uh, uh, the factors that we have uh, listed and are discussing are some measure of the value of money, uh, be it uh, RPI or uh, con consumer CPI. price, CPI, what have you. Um, 
we would want to have factors or a methodology which ensured a flow through of various changes in 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 costs external to the company i'm thinking here of a flow through of access charges or a tax change of some nature a a key factor that is to be geared into needs to be geared into the cap is the is the productivity index some measure of industry wide productivity that that we anticipate so we ensure that this cap is falling over time or at least there is that that factor points in the direction of bringing the cap down over time so that consumers can benefit from the improved incentive structure that we anticipate would result from caps mr chairman thank you very much and mr chairman i know the time is late i have a statement i'd like to put in the record and also i have some additional questions that i'd like to submit to the panel in writing without objection so ordered the gentleman from pennsylvania mr ritter is recognized for one question thank you mr chairman uh... we have heard that the current system uh... provides a perverse incentive to make certain kinds of capital investments which would add to the rate base therefore enhancing the possibilities for increased rate of return. Uh, what are some examples that, from the perspective of the FCC, you could leave with members of this committee uh, that uh, address this less than theoretically, but somewhat more practically, this uh, idea of gold plating? W where have we seen this in the past? I think there are two different kinds of things that we should could consider under the that gold plating category first is uh, investments that may not be necessary uh, that where there is adequate capacity already and for s whatever reason the company has de decided to go forward with the investment uh, and the second is operating expense now with regard to investment we do have our section 214 process and if we see clear evidence that the investment is unnecessary, we will disallow it, not give them permission to build it. However, it's often difficult for us to know in advance whether or not it's required. The company may provide various uh, demand projections, they then s propose a new technology, and we will examine that, but it is, is difficult to, uh, to know that, and uh, we, although we have not done very much actual disallowance in the past sometimes after the fact we have wondered about the company's wisdom or whether they were gaming the system to to build certain of those capacity uh, enhancements the second thing the one that I consider probably more significant is the operating cost level and that's simply a matter of uh, how closely the company can attune its operating costs to the minimum necessary we all know that it is difficult to cut costs, uh, difficult to uh, eliminate extraneous employees or to avoid hiring new ones that might be useful but are not absolutely necessary. And those are the kinds of things that it is very difficult for an outside regulator to even judge. Uh, so that the, what we need in place are incentives for the companies to only incur those costs that will actually uh, produce products demanded by the consumer. But your, your comment is it's not, it's not uh, possible to provide concrete examples of where this may have occurred? It's difficult. Uh, or is it not appropriate? It's, it's that or both? I, if insofar as we could actually tell definitively that it occurred, we could have disallowed it in the past. Uh, the, the question is, is how much of this is going on that we really can't tell. Yeah, what kind of percent, it, Dr. Well, just, you know, I, I was going to say that, that, that Bill McGowan, has, uh, the chairman of MCI, has invited people to look at the sturdiness of the AT&T microwave towers as uh, compared to the sturdiness of the MCI microwave towers, which might be one example that we would want to look at. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> that is a good example because there there stands a stark contrast between uh, the uh, the towers that uh, MCI thought to be uh, adequate and appropriate to uh, well serve uh, their customers and and those which have been deployed by uh, by other by other companies for whatever reasons and that is uh, uh, is uh, as I say one one example of uh, alleged 
uh, investment that may not be necessary. But let me just try to be specific. I cannot recite for you the instances in the past of actual uh, disallowances because, thank goodness, I don't review the 214s uh, uh, all day. But clearly the Commission has disallowed uh, investments uh, in the past. Uh, more often than not, frankly, there is, uh, there is some discussion uh, uh, back and forth with respect to investments, and there are adjustments. So w there are examples, and, and there have been cases uh, of uh, proposed investments uh, uh, that the Commission has thought to be uh, unnecessary and therefore has acted to protect uh, consumers from, from throwing that into the rate base. But the, the larger point is, I guess there are two extra points. The first is, it is very difficult to detect. And we, we, can, s we can see that it is difficult to detect. And this committee this morning has made the point uh, that, in fact, uh, dealing with uh, uh, these questions of, of dollars uh, uh, being invested uh, in various places and in various ways is difficult for the Commission to deal with, given the resources that we have. Now, I believe, as I testified earlier, that we have made improvements in that regard. Uh, we, have, we have systems in place now that I think are going to be much more effective. But the question I ask is why not create a, a regulatory approach uh, that is consistent with and not hostile to my difficulties in trying to detect where there is overinvestment. And, th and that you, the way you do that is with a rate cap proposal. Uh, I think, I think uh, the chairman, Mr. <coughs> chairman, has really hit on the crux of why this is a central issue behind rate cap proposals. It, it, it's, it's, it's a situation that currently exists where there are built-in either perverse incentives or inefficiencies that are in the best interests of gaining rate of return s I domestically or in, in the United States, but perhaps uh, in complete uh, opposition to the needs of, of being globally competitive. And, uh, and I thank the chairman for his comments. Thank you. The Here's gentleman's back. time has expired. I would like to speak on behalf of the, uh, the real chairman of the committee. I think there's a strong interest in having a more specific answer to the question posed by the gentleman from Pennsylvania. When you mention perverse incentives and inefficiencies, I think it would be very helpful for the committee to have a more specific list. For example, a listing, of, and I would envision it in three categories, a listing of the, what, 214 filings, where you actually found an inefficiency and stopped it a listing of the near 214 filings where you thought you had a, an inefficiency but didn't quite have enough evidence to stop it. And then a third and final category, a more ambiguous one, for those areas where you, you couldn't even get enough information for a preliminary 214 filing, but you felt in your bones that the telephone company was gold plating network. Any specific information about abuses I feel would help this committee a great deal in determining exactly how extensive the problem has been if, in the if, past. If the uh, chairman mm -hmm. would yield just for a moment. Yes, I'd be happy I to. Thank you, chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, the chairman used the term abuses, but... Well, let's use your term, perverse incentives or inefficiencies. Yeah, I think that would be fairer because the system may be set up for what uh, well. are more perverse incentives rather than right. abuses seem to be some kind of coordinated effort to countermand the law. I'd be happy to use the gentleman's term of perverse incentives and inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there are no further questions. I appreciate the expert testimony of this panel. The committee will uh, recess for about 10 or 15 minutes for this vote, then we'll welcome the second panel. Thank you very much for your testimony. We will be back with the conclusion of Tuesday's hearing in just a few minutes. C-SPAN's coverage of Election 88 continues on Saturday when we telecast from the Florida State Republican Convention. Live from Orlando, we'll telecast speeches from candidates seeking the Republican presidential nomination. After the candidates speak, you'll get a look at politics in the South as convention organizers hold a straw poll. The non-binding ballot will show the delegate's first choice for presidential candidate. Live Saturday, November 14th, the Florida State Republican Convention, beginning at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 a.m. Pacific Time on C-SPAN. Up next, the conclusion of Tuesday's hearing on the regulation of telephone rates before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. That committee is chaired by Edward Markey of Massachusetts.
resume let me just remind the witnesses that we're operating under the committee rules of uh, all of your statements will be inserted in the record we're going to ask you to summarize in five minutes uh, your statement and uh, try to leave uh, most of the interesting part to, to questions so mr garfinkel welcome to this committee uh, please proceed thank you mr chairman uh, i would like to take a few minutes and tell you about regulation of at and t and why reform is needed the fcc's regulation of the telephone business under the communications act of 1934 is a means of assuring customers just and reasonable prices for quality telephone service but regulation is a means of protecting consumers not an end in itself indeed the current form of rate of return regulation of AT&T has been in place for only 20 years with pervasive competition in the long distance market so-called rate of return or cost of service regulation does a poor job of bringing to consumers the benefit the act promises them in fact it can hurt consumers it can force them to pay higher prices by requiring that prices be based on arbitrary cost allocations not on real economic cost rate of return regulation can discourage innovation that would bring consumers new and higher quality services it can severely diminish the incentive that increased earnings provide to cut costs and develop new services the current form of regulation also imposes massive direct costs on the industry and consumers the NTI has estimated that the direct cost of regulation exceed over $1 billion annually. More serious are the massive indirect costs imposed on consumers. AT&T's market-driven responses for the residential market, Reach Out America, and volume discounts for small businesses, Pro America, are just two cases in point. 2.9 million residential customers have now bought Reach Out America and can save up to 19%. But implementation of Reach Out America was delayed for over a year by the regulatory process. And over 160,000 small businesses have purchased Pro America and achieve average savings per customer of about 7%. Yet Pro America was delayed over a year and three months between the date of filing and the date it was permitted to go into effect. The incentives in the price cap plan will bring the technology of the information age to all segments of American society directly and rapidly. Today, the long distance market is intensely competitive. Currently, over 500 inter-exchange carriers provide service in the United States. At least three facility-based carriers, AT&T, MCI, and US Sprint, offer service in virtually every state. And three other facility-based carriers offer service in 25 or more sta states. MCI and Sprint each have enough capacity to serve the entire demand that exists today for inter-exchange services. Therefore, any attempt by AT&T to raise prices above competitive levels would cause AT&T to lose market share to those competitors who have adequate capacity to satisfy those customers. And consumers are acutely aware of the competitive alternatives available to them. A study released this year conducted jointly by the Consumer Federation of America the American Association of Retired Persons and AT&T reveal that over 90% of consumers know they have a choice of competitive alternatives. AT&T's commitment to resale and sharing and to geographic rate averaging further assure that price benefits are disseminated automatically to all consumers. Further, the Commission's and Congress's continuing oversight permit intervention where and as needed to ensure that customers are receiving the benefits that the Communications Act has promised them. Mr. Chairman, regulatory reform of AT&T is long past due. Nearly 20 years ago, the Commission first concluded that competition in the inter-exchange market was in the public interest. Five years ago, the Commission ended its ta active tariff regulation of AT&T's competitors, leaving AT&T the only inter-exchange car carrier subject to an unequal regulatory process. It has been nearly four years since AT&T divested itself of all but its competitive business. The monopoly for which rate of return regulation may have been appropriate disappeared years ago. The intensely competitive long distance market permits the commission to take the next evolutionary step for AT&T, which is to initiate reform regulation immediately. Thank you.
Uh, Mr. Moyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate having my prepared statement submitted to the record, and I'd like to, uh, just within uh, the five minutes uh, available to me, make a few additional comments. Um, briefly, I think the, the concerns I'd like to bring to this discussion today are those of the business users, uh, those people who are heavily dependent upon telecommunications services and facilities in order to do what they do, whether they're, they're making widgets, whether they're uh, providing some type of enhanced service, whether they're running hotels or airlines. And for these types of businesses, telecommunications is what makes them, if they properly use it, more competitive than other companies in, in their industry, whether those industries are based here or abroad. What is particularly disturbing, I think, about the message we have to bring to the subcommittee today is that we're faced with a commission, and, and you, you, in a sense, got a picture of it from the FCC chairman this morning, where repeatedly the concerns of the business rate payers are not being addressed. Uh, in a uh, fairly lengthy statement, which we had filed in our uh, initial comments to the Federal Communications Commission and its price cap proceeding, and which are appended to the written statement today, we go after problem after problem for which there's no factual differentiation among the panelists who were here on the first panel, or for that matter, anybody here at this table. People may disagree as to how those issues should be decided, but there's no question about the fact that repeatedly the concerns of business users have not been addressed to date. Uh, those problems are problems of constant rate sharing. Specific types of prices continue to vary uh, we've uh, got a chart in uh, our prepared testimony which shows constant rate change going on, makes it difficult uh, to have any long-range planning within the business user community. In fact, many of the managers now joke that long-range planning is about a month long. Um, we find strategically priced tariffs being filed by the carriers. It's interesting that we had a discussion on the first panel about confiscatory tariffs, and yet there was little discussion about the fact that in the record today are numerous complaints about from ratepayers that there are a variety of tariffs, specifically usually for special access, with carrier admissions that they'll be pulling rates return up to 39 percent. I maintain to this subcommittee, and so does the business user community in this country, that those rates are unfair, unlawful, and we ought to have a commission that's going to get around to doing its job and address these concerns that are outstanding in a series of investigations. These concerns are not only being made by business users, but even other carriers, including people uh, at AT&T. We find that uh, the commission basically seems unreceptive to the concerns of business users. And the, the main plea we'd like to make to you today is that first the commission needs to address these concerns before it moves into a price cap proposal. What you find in the, pro the root problems for each one of these that we've outlined in our written testimony is that they're primarily a result of the Commission not providing adequate regulatory resources to make its rules work. What we find is very similar to some of the concerns that GAO raised, that we have rules being proposed for which there are not enough people to do the job. Uh, we also know, I mean, we're all realists about the budgetary situation in this country, there's little or no likelihood that the additional par people are going to be authorized and appropriated by this country in order to do the job. I, I noticed in skimming through the written statement of the uh, chairman of the FCC, they're talking about basically a, to a doubling of, of the bodies uh, over what we have today uh, in working on costs and going through numbers. Uh, either they're going to take them from some other bureau or uh, uh, they have an understanding of the authorization and appropriations process that uh, I don't think most of us in this room have. Uh, it is deeply troubling. We know by the Commission's own admission and uh, in discussions with the Commission staff, including the Bureau Chief, that the price cap proposal that's before you all in this hearing today requires more FCC resources in its initial phases than that that the existing greater return regime requires today. And we would maintain they're not even providing enough resources to make the existing system 
actually work. So if we don't have enough resources being applied to the existing system, and we then have a commission proposing a system that's going to necessitate even more resources, my question to the subcommittee is, where are those resources going to come from? And the biggest concern for us is what we're going to end up having, even if it is well-crafted, and we have serious concerns that the proposal is not well-crafted at the moment, we'll have a system that is flawed, maybe not in how it's written, but flawed in the fact that there's no real intention to make it work. And that is very troubling to us. I'd li like to add a few more points that came up in the uh, discussion between the members and the first panel. One, and I, I, this addresses a question that Congressman Kauke uh, raised to the members of the subcommittee about profitability. Uh, I think a misstatement that is being made and is also found in the Commission's NPRM is that the only way carriers make more money is by increasing their capital investment. That shows a, a fundamental problem in understanding that the other way you make money is to get the Commission, as we've seen repeatedly since the mid-60s, to increase your authorized rate of return. So you don't have to make any additional capital investment. You just get the Commission to raise your authorized rate of return. Therefore, you can raise the prices to those new ceilings. That should be pointed out. It's important. Two, bypass. It is a non-issue. With all of the rate churn and, and a 39 percent strategically priced special access prices on the books today. If carriers wanted an incentive to uh, bolt from doing business with the local networks, they don't need to have price caps applied to AT&T. The problems are already out there. The reason the Commission's not been able to show you that it is a problem factually is for a practical matter. For most of the businesses in this country, regardless of which state they're in, there is for all practical purposes no alternative for the majority of those companies' needs but to use the local telephone company network for their local needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Mr. Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Leland Schmidt, Vice President, Industry Affairs for GTE. My appearance today is on behalf of the United States Telephone Association. USTA is the National Trade Association of the Local Exchange Carrier Industry. USTA's member companies are facilities-based providers of comprehensive local networks which deliver local telephone and access services to 99% of residential and business customers throughout the nation. The Commission's Notice of Proposed Rulemaking is of critical importance to the local ex exchange carrier industry and their customers. It proposes a model of interstate regulation where the primary focus is on the prices themselves rather than on the cumbersome mechanistic process that results in prices. The Commission has tentatively concluded that for the price cap model should be applied to interstate offerings of all dominant carriers. USTA believes that when applied to local exchange carriers and AT&T, price cap regulation will better accommodate the evolving telecommunications marketplace. At this time, I would make to, like to make two points very clear. First, price cap regulation is not tantamount to deregulation. It will not diminish current regulatory obligations to ensure reasonable interstate rates. It will not result in any reduction in service quality. It simply offers a more efficient form of federal regulation. States will continue to regulate about 80 percent of a local exchange carrier's costs. At issue here is regulation of the 20 percent <coughs> of the local exchange carrier's costs allocated to the interstate jurisdiction. The second point is the requirement that a price cap mode of regulation by the FCC needs to simultaneously encompass both local exchange carriers as well as AT&T if customer benefits are to be gained. In its comments submitted to the Commission, USTA suggested three specific <coughs> objectives the Commission should use in evaluating price cap regulation as a viable regulatory option. First, the Commission should seek to benefit the broadest range of customers through the introduction of new services and lower prices, 
by increasing incentives for operational efficiencies. Second, any new method of local exchange carrier regulation should be simple, easy to administer, and reduce unnecessary regulatory requirements. Third, the universal service goals, including necessary high-cost support and revenue streams, must be preserved. FCC regulation of local exchange carriers has significantly increased since divestiture and the institution of access charges. The sheer magnitude of the documentation accompanying each local exchange carrier's access tariff filing is evidence of this fact. Reforming regulation in order to simplify this process and to decrease administrative costs will be of benefit to the local exchange carriers but the primary beneficiary will be their customers. Such efforts will be of even greater value to small telephone companies and their customers. The Commission, in response to evolving technology, has introduced competition into a number of interstate markets. Telecommunications markets, which once had stringent entry barriers, are now open. Continuing technological advances available to anyone demand a reevaluation of traditional regulatory policies. These technologies have already provided and will increasingly broaden the effective competitive alternatives to local exchange carrier networks. Local exchange carriers' customers suffer when local exchange carriers are not allowed sufficient regulatory flexibility to encourage customer use of their public networks. To summarize my comments, I would like to make three closing points. First, local exchange carriers continue to use the industry's customer-focused goals in its public policy responses. Those goals are to achieve the broadest connectivity reasonably attainable, to achieve usage charges which encourage efficient use of the network, and to reduce the scope and complexity of regulation. FCC price cap regulation has the potential of enhancing attainment of all three goals. Second, the FCC pursuit of this idea is not something new. Most state regulatory agencies have under active consideration or have already made decisions to move away from detailed cost allocations as a basis for setting prices. The FCC is not plowing new ground here. Third, if there is a public policy objective of a feature-rich local public network with services available to a broad customer constituency, regulation needs to be altered to allow such an outcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kimmerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the Consumer Federation of America, I appreciate this opportunity to present our views to you this morning on the FCC's proposal to replace rate of return regulation with a price cap model. If I may, I'd like to submit our filing with the FCC on this proposal for your record. Uh, it has been provided to all the members of the subcommittee. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, it's um, unusual and it's a pleasure to, um, to be witness uh, in a hearing where the chairman of the subcommittee and the ranking minority member have both uh, indicated very strong concerns about consumer interests and have directed the FCC to respond to those concerns. We very much appreciate uh, you sending that message to the FCC. Uh, we also appreciate um, Chairman Patrick's interest in taking care of consumers' concerns. Uh, he seems to have taken a slightly different approach than what we have experienced in the past and has been uh, listening to uh, many of the problems that we have uh, raised about these issues. Uh, so we're optimistic about this. Unfortunately, um, this proposal is not so simple, uh, and it carries many dangers. Uh, while the price cap concept for consumers might be uh, an interesting idea with many commodities, uh, we're concerned about it for telephones. And while we're certainly not against change, even when things are going well, um, we always would like things to be done better. Uh, there are a number of dangers that are raised by this proposal that we'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, this agency apparently has a history, from our perspective, of creating problems where they don't exist. 
and then coming up with a solution to the problems they've created that may make the situation even worse uh... we urge you to look carefully at the record of rate of return regulation uh... it is a fabulous record and unlike mr garfinkel's comment it is not a twenty year history it is a history since the passage of the communications act and state regulation of communications carriers look at innovation in telecommunications surpasses almost every other industry look at research and development beyond most every other industry capital investment surpasses almost every other industry stables earning performance through the twentieth century and most important to the people who i'm worried about declining prices declining real prices for consumers in this country now the chairman of the f c c this morning said that the problem with the rate of return is that it guarantees an earning uh... it is inherently flawed and it's like a cost plus contract this description scares me to death because there is no guaranteed earning under rate of return regulation. The FCC is ordered by this Congress to prescribe rates that involve looking at the appropriate costs and setting a reasonable rate of return. No guaranteed rate of return has never existed under the just and reasonable rate standard of the Communications Act and hopefully never will exist. It is great concern to hear this description of what rate of return means. Uh, if that is what regulation is going on today, we have cause to be concerned. There have been problems that have arisen in the past with the FCC. Uh, to stop bypass, which we don't believe is going on, and we heard Mr. Moyer indicate it's not, we now have $2.6 billion added to consumers' local phone bills, going up to $3.5 billion by next year to take care of a problem that we don't see existing. We see an abandonment of the separate subsidiary requirements by the FCC, replaced with cost allocation rules which were described this morning in the, from the GAO's report as leaving ratepayers less than fully protected against inappropriate rate increases. And we've seen policies that are designed to promote competition in the telecommunications industry, but we see a market that is far from competitive. We see a market with umbrella pricing and rates very similar among all long-distance companies, not to even mention the fact that in the local arena there is no competition. So we do have a problem. But if the FCC would just clean up its act and do what it's supposed to do under the Communications Act, they would do a far better job of protecting ratepayers than by looking to new theories that possibly just cover up the mistakes that they have made in the past. Our fear is very simple, Mr. Chairman. Despite the laudable goal of this price cap proposal, uh, depending on how it's implemented, it may deny consumers the historical benefits of declining cost industry. 60% decline in the cost of phone service controlling for inflation since the Communications Act. And it may face, fa force ratepayers to bail out long distance companies that can't make it in the marketplace, bail them out by allowing inappropriately high profits that conceal the inability of competition to develop, bail out an industry allowing inappropriate earnings rather than forcing these companies to com compete prices down. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we urge you to look very carefully at the FCC proposal to see if it serves the public interest goals that matter to Congress and to ensure that the Commission prescribes just and reasonable rates as Congress has directed it to do. The last time a federal agency tried to do something like what the FCC has proposed with price caps under a similar just and reasonable rate standard, it was found to be illegal by the federal courts and that agency was told that it looked more like it was proposing dialing for dollars rather than the price is right. Mr. Chairman, consumers don't want phone companies to be dialing for their dollars. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kimmelman. I'm going to uh, recognize uh, myself. And, and Mr. Kimmelman, I have three questions which uh, seem to me to, to pose some contradictions. I'd like to just repeat the three questions and then you go ahead. And then I will ask Mr. Garfinkel one. I will uh, time myself so that we're each under the five-minute rule. Uh, Mr. Kimmelman, as I remember, your organization supported the right of consumers to buy their own phones, answering machines, and other freedoms to connect equipment to the telephone lines. I also seem to remember that it was supposedly in the best interest of the consumer to have options to AT&T in the long-distance market. This being the case, I'm puzzled by the first line in your testimony, which states, quote, major changes in telecommunications policy 
are less driven by market failure and catastrophic events than by exotic theories and untested hypotheses. I'd like to know how you reconcile those past positions with your present statement. Secondly, in your filing, you mentioned that uh, the current cost of telecommunications regulations are close to $1 billion per year and that you didn't think this was an unreasonable cost. And I, I want to tell you that my constituents, and I think many of the constituents of, of these members would be concerned if they found out that it cost a billion dollars a year to regulate the phone companies, whether paid through their phone bills or taxes. And I'm just wondering if you're willing to consider any kind of new regulatory proposal that would lower the cost of regulation to the consumer. And the third, uh, the third question is, is uh, your filing, be uh, CFA's filing, you state, quote, the determination of a fair rate of return and the setting of prices is a difficult process, fraught with uncertainties and contention, end of quote. Now, if you said that, why are consumers better off under a system, quote, fraught with uncertainties, end of quote, than under one that offers a price ceiling such as price caps? Well, those are fair questions, Mr. Chairman. Starting at the end, uh, the reason they may be better off, not certainly, it depends on how a price cap model is done. But even though it is fraught with uncertainties and it's a difficult process, consumers have done well. The empirical record shows that regulators have stepped in and not accepted all the cost claims by the companies, not allowed significant rate increases in this industry, and that consumers have benefited from that. Why give it up if we've been doing so well? Point one. On the cost issue, yes, a billion dollars is a lot, but for a hundred to hundred and fifty billion dollar industry, uh, less than one percent cost of administering the industry is not a very high cost from our perspective. If regulators did nothing in this year other than pass through to ratepayers the savings that they deserve from federal tax reform that passed this Congress, they would provide savings of a billion dollars just by doing that one regulatory function. That would take care of the cost of regulation by itself, one simple act, and there's much more that can be done. On your first question, Mr. Chairman, uh, we did support change in the telecommunications industry where it was shown clearly that there was ripe for competition, it was ripe for change, there was no need to continue regulating. The equipment market was a clear example of that, and we stand by that assertion today. What the problem is for us is claiming that you can totally revamp regulation regardless of the competitiveness of the rest of the market, regardless of concerns for cross subsidies and cost allocation, based on a new theory that has never been fully tested. To us, that is a great risk, a great danger in a marketplace that has served consumers' interests very well with rate of return regulation. Will the gentleman yield just, just for a brief moment? Yes, Matt. I yield. Thank the gentleman. Uh, it hasn't, hasn't it been true, though, in the past that the Consumer Federation of America has always been interested in price controls and price caps? And when you think back to the oil uh, situation, they were very much strong supporters of oil price controls. Oh. Well, Mr. Ritter, we do not support price controls in any competitive market at all. We absolutely never have, and I assure you, we never will. Um, and we certainly wouldn't support it in telecommunications if we thought that it, our market was truly competitive. There have been very few instances when we've ever supported those types of controls. Thank you. I'll, let me uh, just turn now to Mr. Garfinkel. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat troubled by your recommendation that your price, that the price cap should be adjusted according to CPI but with no productivity adjustment. Uh, I think as the chart shows and a number of other uh, witnesses have testified, uh, there sim seems to be an inconsistency between the, the spiraling uh, costs and, and the level of performance of the CPI. Also, you're recommending uh, that the FCC not monitor earnings under the price cap approach. And I guess my question is, uh, why is it, uh, Mr. Garfinkel, that uh, you don't want to hold the industry to that uh, very high level of performance productivity that is the staple of uh, AT&T, and uh, don't you think that your productivity uh, gain should be shared with consumers? First of all, I think you have to understand the nature of our proposal to the FCC. What we were talking about where the CPI would apply would be to our portion <coughs> of the total rate, which is less than 50 percent of the total rate, because 50 percent of the charges that are imposed on us are imposed by the local exchange carriers through the form of access charges. If those would remain stable or reduced, then in fact 
our rates would go up no more than half of the c p i and in any event secondly the c p i does include a productivity factor within it component for that the third consideration is that fundamentally in a competitive market we think that prices will be driven below the c p i in our marketplace conditions in any event the chair will now recognize the gentleman from new jersey and if gentlemen if i have to leave abruptly is because i have to testify for another committee and i will return as soon as i can but i will wait for mr hall who will be coming to chair the hearing go ahead thank you very much mr chairman mr kimmelman and i'm particularly interested in your testimony you know that the positive result of rate of return uh, regulation over a period of many years. In fact, uh, you just stated the record of rate of return is a fabulous record. Yet, if my recollection is correct, in the past you were one of the most vocal critics of rate of return regulation. And when did you suddenly decide that rate of return all of a sudden was beneficial for consumers? Uh, Mr. Rinaldo, we didn't change our mind. We have been critical of how rate of return regulation has been applied, particularly at the FCC in many instances, often in the states. Uh, the, uh, there, there has been no change of heart. We, are urging, we have urged the FCC to follow the Congressional mandate in the Communications Act and regulate appropriately. There have been times when we have disagreed. Um, under rate of return regulation, the FCC in recent past has done one of the most beneficial things, and that is reduced AT&T and the regional bell companies' rate of return just less than two years ago, which dropped long distance rates dramatically. So we have been critical of the Commission uh, where they have strayed from what we believe they ought to do under rate of return, but never critical of the form of regulation itself. Uh, you also stated in response, well, earlier in your testimony, in regard to price caps that it depends on how it's implemented. You then said uh, in response to a, one of the questions that were propounded by uh, Congressman Richardson is that the consumer may be better off with price caps. Does this mean that in reality the Consumer Federation has an open mind on this subject and you're waiting to see what specific action the FCC takes and then, if then in your determination that action is going to probably result in lower cost to the consumer that you would support price caps? Yes, Mr. Rinaldo, and this, this helps me get back to one of Mr. Richardson's questions I didn't react to. Um, we do have an open mind on this issue. Uh, the details are very important, uh, and so we and we are certainly very supportive of looking to streamline the regulatory process. I believe Mr. Garfinkel raised a number of concerns about regulation that are appropriate, that ought to be addressed, that have been problems in the past. However, we believe that under the Communications Act and under the the needs of the consuming public, it's imperative where a company has monopoly power, has market power, to look at the earnings. There may be a new way of doing it. There may be a streamlined fashion of applying uh, earnings-based regulation and cost-based regulation, uh, and it's possible to do that within a price cap model. We are certainly open to that, but we're very concerned about anything that moves completely looking at the earnings of a company that is a virtual monopoly. Do you have any specific reg uh, recommendations as to how the price cap model could be improved? Uh, yes, we have proposed a number of things to the FCC in filings um, on this proceeding uh, that in very general terms involve a, a banded approach to looking at uh, the earnings of a company and looking at the precise marketplace where it's competitive you don't need these types of constraints where it is not competitive less the competitive competitive we believe there needs to be an evaluation of cost and earnings you say that yet uh, <coughs> you favor competition you know you said you see and then you and you know some of this sort of puzzles me you said we see a market that is far from competitive it was an exact quote and in effect indicating that competition in long distance service is feeble. But yet isn't it true that AT&T's major competitors, particularly MCI and US Sprint, are investing billions of dollars in their long, their long distance networks with a long term commitment to the business. MCI, for example, has a strong financial backing of IBM, 
And that's certainly a titan among uh, corporations in this country. The competing carriers continue to increase their market share at AT&T's expense. And I don't think any of us expect that, uh, as a result of divestiture, AT&T to lose a large market share immediately. So really, competition is increasing. Competition is there. Competition is taking place. And under all of the circumstances that I mentioned, I think it's, uh, I don't think characterizing it as feeble or far from competitive is a uh, proper characterization. Well, Mr. Renato, I, I do believe it's proper. You're absolutely correct that we have supported com competition in long distance, and, uh, and we agree with you that it cannot emerge overnight. It would take time. We're very concerned, though, about how it is developing. There's no question about the fact that in certain niche markets, uh, there are greater competitive forces. In the markets that most consumers are worried about, where they use their long-distance service, they are not finding the great fruits of competition that were promised. They are finding prices of all the carriers that are very similar to each other. We are finding, as the chairman of the FCC correctly pointed out this morning, that most of the long-distance rate reductions have been driven by regulatory decisions, not by competition in the market. What we are concerned about in shifting to a new model of regulation, if it allows greater profits instead of the competitive spur to pass through savings to consumers, we could find rates not going up dramatically, but not necessarily coming down the way they have in the past, not passing through the benefits of technology. It's certainly of concern to us to find MCI, AT&T's greatest competitor, coming out for a less regulatory model of AT&T, a basic change in philosophy, a concern from us that it's quite clear under regulation the competitors' <coughs> profits uh, have been shrinking. To us, that is an appropriate regulatory response to the marketplace. If competition cannot survive, why should we have it? We would not like to see regulators artificially bolster a market, making it look competitive when it really isn't. But we have no, do we, do we have any proof that that would take place? No, Mr. Rinaldo, but what we have is concern that when the, when the key competitors are agreeing to get away from profit regulation, uh, where it's clear that all of them could benefit with increased profits as a result of that, it looks more like an oligopoly market. It looks like a, mar a market that has strong monopoly tendencies. Did you ever think of the possibility, and maybe it exists, that they could benefit from increased profits, and that could also, the incentive could also cause uh, consumers to benefit from lower costs? Yeah, we certainly have, Mr. Rinaldo, and the, our, our response is, if we can do that, that's fine. We need a very carefully calibrated approach to making sure that happens. So far, we've not seen that. But you are going to reserve judgment until the FCC comes out with their Absolutely. proposal. Absolutely. Thank you. I just have one more question, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to direct it to Mr. Schmidt, if I may. Uh, <coughs> local exchange companies generally have taken the position that they should be included in any price cap system that's implemented and that they should be included in that immediately. However, the FCC has taken the position that they see some administrative problems with immediate implementation of the price caps for LECs. Now, would you comment on how difficult or whether or not there is any difficulty in resolving those types of problems? Uh, yes. Thank you for the question. Uh, and I'm sp specifically speaking about uh, cost accounting problems, uh, pricing differences among LECs and things like that that have to be resolved in time to include them in the price cap plan? Well, basically all of the exchange carriers have prices for the various services in the interstate arena that exist today. Uh, from our standpoint, that's a good starting point. There's no reason to have to try to create a whole new process to try to create the starting point prices. Therefore, we don't think that there is a large amount of uh, administrative or logistical problems involved in in uh, an ap applying this at an early date to local exchange carriers. We think, as a matter of fact, that much of the administrative burden that exists today is because each of our prices of each of the exchange carriers has to go through, through a very laborious, tedious cost process, cost justification, and uh, that is creating uh, a, a lot of administrative costs and burdens today that we think could be eliminated. So we don't see a problem with proceeding immediately to apply it to local exchange carriers. 
I think in fairness, perhaps Com Mr. Garfinkel would like yes. to comment on that question and the response. Well, what I would like to uh, add, Congressman Rinaldo, too, uh, really is in response to uh, Mr. Kimmelman's comments about the feeble nature of competition. Uh, I think uh, both uh, chairman, uh, the chairman of the FTC and I have alluded to the fact that there are over 500 competitive carriers serving uh, the country today. That number is actually 561, according to the industry analysis group uh, who uh, records and licenses these carriers. That number has grown. It's grown continuously over the last year. Uh, we have as many as 178 competitors in the state of Texas alone, ranging down to 15 competitors in the states of Maine and Vermont, 13 in Montana. Uh, I think uh, you have to look at the growth of the competitive industry, too. The competitive industry revenues as of the end <coughs> of 1986 were over $7.5 billion, and they served over 11 million customers. In addition to that, there's a proliferation, an explosion of technology in this country uh, with the deployment of digital fiber facilities by a number of carriers. Uh, I don't know ma how many of you have heard of NTN or LightNet or Teleconnect or RCI who have deployed network. The NTN network is 11,000 uh, miles of fiber <coughs> alone. And that capacity and the choices that are available to customers uh, put a, a profound check on the price that AT&T may charge to customers. As I said before, if we price above competitive levels, then customers will shift away from us. They know those choices. The CFA study showed that. There's also in the business market, uh, as Mr. Moyer can tell you, there are uh, consultants who serve to work the pricing algorithms so that as prices change, uh, customers shift their, their services and the, and the quantity of services they, they buy from different tariffs. In addition to that, the TRAC group right here in Washington offers a service to residential uh, consumers that will monitor the bills and, and tell you which is the least cost provider of service for your calling characteristics. So competition is real. Did you want to uh, also comment on the question I asked Mr. Schmidt? That's how we started out, if you recall. I'm, I'm sorry. I that was a question regarding the local exchange companies and uh, their position via the, the price caps, whether or not they could be included immediately and whether or not, uh, well, let's put it very bluntly, would you be amenable to that? Do you have any objection to the LECs being included? Well, I think as I said uh, before, we have an intense competitive market in the inter-exchange market area, and I think uh, uh, capping or some form of reform regulation is, is overdue. I think <coughs> uh, as you look at the uh, local exchange market, there is a difference in condition, in market condition, and any plan that would be developed for the local exchange carriers has to recognize that difference. And it has to have within it certain safeguards, and I think Mr. Moyer can amplify on that. All right, Mr. Moyer. We'll uh, I'd like to make a, a, a few points on some of the questions. One, I think ratepayers, whether they're consumers or business uh, users, have had real substantive concerns about how well the Commission's actually been implementing today's system, and that's uh, laid out in considerable detail in the testimony before you. But you're right, there have been some competitive changes going on out there, although what I, I, I think the business users uh, have to say, and, and Mr. Garfinkel alluded to it, that as far as the local exchange goes, there is for all practical purposes no alternative for the majority, of the vast majority of the business users out there and the vast majority of their needs that are dependent upon the local network. There is, for all practical purposes, no alternative. But in the case of the long distance market, there have been changes. And way before we got to this Commission's present proposal uh, and its NPRM in an earlier docket, uh, uh, 87421, for those people that follow docket numbers, uh, we had. Uh, 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 it mentioned to the Commission that there may be a need to have some flexibility for AT&T as some of the markets it's in become more competitive. Unfortunately, we never got to the next phase of that docket. It's now been frozen. Uh, we've had no further articulation from the Commission on how we, we might move forward in, in working with some of the long-distance carriers. And the next thing the Commission did was decide that they were going to apply the price cap proposal across the board. 
uh, it's just the left foot would go first with AT&T, and then the right foot would apply it for the, less, the rest of the local exchange carriers. And that was deeply disturbing to the user community. If I, if I really understand your response, you know, and I think uh, it's obvious where some of us up here are coming from. You know, there's no objection to price caps, but I think everyone's concerned and wants to be certain that the consumer also benefits. In other words, there should be a benefit to the consumers as well as to the companies. And we talk about part of that benefit coming about as a result of increased efficiencies. Now, if the benefit comes about, or at least part of it, and if we, if, and if we acknowledge that fact as a result of increased efficiency and we support the price cap for that reason, and we're assuming all of this for sake of argument, then wouldn't the same thing be true? Wouldn't that price cap also be beneficial to customers both in long distance and local service? So if that is true, why shouldn't uh, local companies be included too? Uh, that's a good question, uh, uh, quoting uh, Mr. Schmidt there. Uh, I, I think you raised a good point, and there's an answer for that. There's been considerable discussion here this morning, uh, I guess now also this afternoon, uh, about the fact that we need to go to price caps in order to take away these draconian disincentives to making wise investments. And yet it's interestingly obviated or, or, or missed that the LECs, in particular the box, have been leading spokespersons in this country since the early discussions of divestiture that the boogeyman in this business is the business user community under the auspices of bypass and that we're going to run willy-nilly away from the local phone company, that rates are going to go through the roof, all of Gene Kimmelman's uh, members, which I guess are us when we go home, are going to be uh, 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 left to carry the burden of the network, and yet, if that was the case, then why would the local phone companies willy-nilly make these investments that were going to raise their costs that would force them to raise their prices? It is not logical. The box and the Lex can't have it both ways. Either bypass is a problem, in which case it's insane to go out and willy-nilly raise their costs, or bypass isn't the problem. But what we find is, depending on what issue we're talking about, price caps, bypass, you find different data and different rhetoric coming out of the local exchange companies. And they can't have it both ways. The bottom line is there aren't alternatives to the local phone companies. Even though the gentleman's time has expired, we'll allow him another 45 minutes. To <laughs> 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 I'll make it up for all those other people that aren't here. <laughs> I'm determined I'm going to understand this before I leave, at least get some, elicit some responses to some of these questions. Let me shift over to Mr. Garfinkel for the final, final question. <laughs> My understanding is that, and he brought up the, ca the uh, problem of um, bypass, I understand on a price cap regulation, AT&T would have greater incentives to reduce costs than under rate of return regulation, correct? That's true. All right. Now, I also understand that access charges from the LECs account for a significant portion of your costs. Now, if price caps were implemented for AT&T only, would its incentive to bypass the local exchange companies be greater since they would not have the same pricing flexibility? I think the answer to that is that absolutely not. I don't see any difference under the current regime of regulation or price capping as to the incentives that AT&T would experience for uh, so-called bypass. I think you have to understand what, what bypass policy of AT&T is, and we've articulated to uh, Congress before as well as publicly, and we said that our first choice is to look to the local exchange carriers for access provisioning. Uh, the reason for that is, and the simple fact is, that we believe that they are the ones that can provide access at the lowest possible price. Uh, they have the traffic that they can aggregate and therefore develop the lowest unit cost. However, we serve customers, and customers are looking for economically rational alternatives. And what the local exchange carriers do 
and the pricing and the quality of access is very very significant but i don't think they'll be any change in incentives those incentives exist today we work with the local exchange carriers directly and through our tariff intervention indirectly to try to get price of access at something resembling a trend down toward economic cost in any event the reason the LECs can file tariffs that uh, earn 39 percent uh, uh, or close to that by their own admission is because there is no bypass alternative for many of those services, which is why if there were alternatives, we could, because of the tariffs they're filing at full 39 percent, the major users, whether they're in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or Texas, would have already done so. All right. This and time. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you, and I just want to say that uh, some of the testimony here is quite different than what we received when we held the hearings on a sub subscriber line charge. Right. Thank the gentleman at this time. I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kimmelman, I, I just want to uh, inquire again about your, your view of price caps or essen essentially price controls. You, you mentioned that you, you never supported price caps when there was a competitive situation. So I, I assume that uh, you did not view the oil industry at the time that you supported price controls on oil to be a competitive situation. Correct. And you've also mentioned that uh, you do not view the uh, current uh, telephone exchange, inter-exchange business to be very competitive either. So by that reasoning, you should support price caps, or have, have I missed something? Well, you missed one point, Mr. Ritter, and that is that because it is not competitive, we support thorough regulation of the earnings of the companies in that industry because they have market power, they have monopoly power. <coughs> Different ways of regulating them, but rate of return is what has traditionally been used and been very successful. But you all have been in opposition to rate of return regulation and have been overall supportive of price controls of various kinds and no, sizes I, and shapes. That is not accurate, Mr. Ritter. We have been supportive of rate of return regulation in utility industries that, that exert monopoly power. We have only been I supportive of, of uh, any kind of price controls in market aberration situations like the energy crisis situation. That's been the only instance, to my recollection, that we've supported that type of market intervention. Uh, and otherwise, where there are competitive factors, we support uh, letting the competitors compete without government intervention. Um, one, of, one of the areas that uh, probably should be discussed is the experience of the states. As it was pointed out before, 12 states have uh, adopted price cap regulatory schemes. Um, is there something we can learn from the states as we uh, consider the, the international, nat the national network? Uh, Mr. Moore? Um, I, I think there are. In fact, I hope that uh, uh, if, if we're all still here for the next panel, ask, ask the uh, commissioner from New York, who I believe is going to be testifying in the third panel, and, and ask her, first of all, to differentiate how a, a good state public utility commission goes about looking at rates to start with. I can't remember in all of my years in this town the last time we had, out of the FCC, an investigation of a tariff such as we see at many of the states. Cross-examination, interrogatories, uh, oral hearings before the commissioners themselves. The last oral hearing I can remember this FCC ever having was, uh, I think, back in 1981 on the migration strategies, uh, uh, which even uh, uh, the, the company that was beat upon may have recognized was not the best proposal. Uh, and so, yes, I think there are some things we can look at from the states. And what happens is we have states that have been actively doing their job in determining costs and determining rates. And so you're saying basically that if, if the FCC would more uh, fulfill it, its audit and investigatory uh, role that price caps would not be a bad idea. Well, we would then have some valid benchmarks to begin to judge its price cap proposals. Uh, so you're saying that the, it's not the idea itself that does not have merit. You're saying that the states just do a better job than the FCC no, does in no, carrying out the I, I think obligations. 
I don't think the record's clear that this, what the states, those states that have toyed with some price cap changes, what they're doing is exactly what the Commission's proposing. In fact, we don't even know yet what the Commission's actually proposing. There are a series of questions in there. Uh, it would seem to me that your users, though, would, would appreciate some more, some greater stability in, in pricing, some uh, holding of the line on pricing, which is, isn't that what price caps imply? I agree, but, but not if stability is going to be at a 39 percent LEC admitted Is this the Maryland cap. situation? No, uh, they're around the country. Strategic pricing exists in uh, Pennsylvania, exists in New Jersey, it exists in a number of states. It's where the LECs, by their own admission, file yeah. the typically special access tariffs for circuits that, that businesses have no alternative but The to problem use. with a large percentage of a small number could still be uh, a very small impact in, in, in overall. And I, I think, you know, if, you, if we want to use these percentages, let's just see how much dollar volume is involved. Let's see what the impact of the total system is, rather than bandying around the, these uh, exorbitant uh, Well, th those are carrier percentages. figures. We just rely yeah, on Yeah, I understand. Them. But, but, it, but they, you know, uh, statistics sometimes, uh, especially percentage increases, uh, don't really tell a full story. Um, but I, I want to get back just to d Mr. Garfinkel. Did you want to comment on that, that last question about the experience well, of the I states? I think the experience in the states uh, could be um, used in developing the plan at the federal level. The, as was mentioned previously, there are actually 31 states who have implemented some type of regulatory reform, 12 of whom have moved away from greater return regulation. Of the 12, two just moved away within the last 90 days or so. So there's no experience factor in those states. But in eight of the ten states where there has been movement away from rate of return regulation, prices have gone down and gone down appreciably. Uh, in the two states where prices have gone up, they've gone up as a function of access charge increases. So we had to respond in our prices for that. Uh, prices have gone down, for example, in the state of Nevada as much as 32 percent. I think I in looking at the state operation, though, and you hit upon it uh, directly, uh, Congressman Ritter, uh, you have to recognize that AT&T in the competitive market is no longer a public utility. We do not have the rate base that we had previously uh, prior to divestiture. And in the state of Maryland, for example, we have a very small rate base. And 1 percent return or change in our uh, revenues actually would imply about a 10 percent change in return on equity because of the large amount of leased facilities that we purchase from the local company and also because uh, we're paying over 60 percent of our revenues in that state in the form of access charges. So uh, the traditional return measures are no longer appropriate. Mr. Schmidt, do you want to comment on that? I was going to let the 39 percent lay, but uh, it's been brought up too many times. Uh, very specifically, the FCC has a process of uh, ra rate of return monitoring under existing rules which effectively do not allow the exchange carriers to even make its authorized rate of return. It's something, currently it's, le it's 12 percent. Something less than 12 is the aggregate rate of return on interstate operations of the exchange carriers. Now, that isn't 39 percent. We can pick out a thing. We can pick out a number that may result in that, but the question is, do we get to keep it? And the answer is no. Uh, part of the problem is you've got a mechanistic process that involves many detailed forecasts of both costs and units a year, year and a half ahead of time. The result of that may turn out to be a number, but it's a very small base, as you suggest. And there's a process under the existing formula where we don't get to keep it anyway, so we don't have motivation to be that. I have a last comment. Uh, uh, there was a description of, of profit as if somehow profit was incompatible with the interest of consumers. And I, I think that is a, a misconception that you sometimes find around this town. But some of America's more profitable corporations have provided the finest and the lowest cost products to consumers, and 
it is it is not incompatible that a more profitable company whether it's a computer company or a, a telephone company could provide better service at lower costs to the consumers and, and frankly that's usually the way america's worked you know, the the the, the, pro the companies that, that don't make any money generally uh, don't provide very good service and uh, I, I understand the, the nature of, of uh, the competitive uh, imperative here there has to be competition but uh, I think we have seen competition burgeoning now you again you got you play with numbers if you look at from day one when all th when the first phone company started to today um, the numbers don't look near as good as if you look at the numbers in terms of growth of the markets that Mr. Garfinkel was talking about, if you look at the growth in those uh, competition numbers, the dollar volume of, of sales and the, the, uh, the percentage change in market share, you get a very different picture of what at the margin is happening in this industry. Congressman, I think you make a good point. Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the long distance market, there clearly, as you've pointed out, been some competitive changes. But if you're interested, uh, I'll be glad to volunteer some Pennsylvania business users to talk to you about within the state for their local needs. Those alternatives for the majority of their needs flat don't exist yet today. If I could just add, Mr. Ritter, um, we certainly are not anti-profit, and I agree with you completely. There is nothing wrong with profit. Uh, when a company can put a Except new Except when they're obscene. Well, I, I would say that, that where a company can put a new product on the market and beat its competitors and earn a high rate of return uh, and provide a good product to the consuming public at a low cost, that's wonderful. Our problem is only when that company does not really have competition and the prices are not coming down the way they were in the good old days and their earnings start going up. That's what we're concerned about in this marketplace. Um, the concentration in the telecommunications market as it is today is such that under the Justice Department's merger guidelines, they would not allow mergers in an industry this concentrated. To us, that means that there's a sign of some market power that ought to be looked at very carefully. Does anybody want to, would you comment on that, Mr. Garfinkel? Because I think it it's an important point. I, I'm sorry, I missed the point uh, that, that uh, Mr. Kimlin was talking about, essentially. I think uh, what he was saying, basically, that uh, uh, you can look at a picture, oh, I think if I can interpret for you, uh, you can look at the picture overall, but if you look, and as what Mr. Moyer is saying, but you look at certain segments of markets and they, they uh, can be uh, monopolistic while rates of, while uh, profits are rising substantially and that this is not, uh, this is not competition, this is uh, uh, not healthy. I think what I've tried to demonstrate, and we will have studies that we can provide to the uh, committee for the record that show the, the pervasive nature <coughs> of competition in the United States. For example, I don't know whether I cited this fact before, 95% of the access minutes, which are the called minutes, originate in lo local areas where there are three or more competitors today. And there are choices available. Now, whether people choose to exercise that or not is a function of how frequently they call and what their patterns of calling are. But there is the availability of alternatives, and that's what makes the market competitive. Michael Porter uh, did a very comprehensive pa paper on proving the competitiveness of any industry and using el elements of, you know, just that fact, uh, choice, proliferation of choice and availability. Uh, I think when you're dealing in a competitive marketplace, you lower your price structure in general to respond to competition. And whether Mr. Kimmelman's uh, constituents uh, realize it or not, they're going to get benefit of that competitive pressure. Because, th again, as I mentioned, uh, competitive pressure, in it's, it's axiomatic in one of the imperatives of a competitive marketplace is to drive prices to cost basis. And so his constituency does benefit. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and I do thank uh, this committee, and, and thank you for your input. Gentlemen, thank you. I'd like to now call up the third panel.
We have uh, Mr. James R. Wilson, president of XIT Rural Telephone Co-op from out in Dalhart, Texas. And I say out in Dalhart, Texas, I correctly identify it. Because I understand, Mr. Wilson, your hometown is uh, nearer to five other state capitals sure. than it is to your own. That's correct. We also have Mr. John Hoffman, chairman of CompTEL. Have Gail Garfield Swartz, who is the deputy chairman of New York State Public Service. We have Mr. John Glenn, who is Maryland People's Council and we welcome you to the committee at this time. I, I would say to you who have taken your time and uh, expended your funds to come before this committee to not be dismayed by the lack of members in attendance because Chairman Markey will uh, make available to all the members uh, your testimony and uh, more important than that, uh, members, staffers are here and present and sometimes it's more important that they understand the testimony and receive it than it is that the member himself or herself do so. But we thank you and don't gauge the appreciation of Chairman Markey and this committee by the attendance or lack of attendance here because each of them have five or more subcommittees and, and we're on the last day of this week, so they're spread pretty thin today. At this time, I recognize uh, Mr. Wilson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is James Wilson. I serve as president of XI2 Rural Telephone Cooperative in Dalhart, <coughs> Texas. Today, I also represent the National Telephone Cooperative Association. With me today is our CEO, Jimmy White. I appreciate the opportunity to share our concerns about the FCC's proposal to replace cost of serv service regulation with price cap regulation. XIT is a small local exchange carrier. We serve 895 customers in rural West Texas, and we have a density of less than one subscriber per mile of telephone line. I will not try to provide an overall evaluation of the Commission's price cap plan today, but will focus on the concerns of small telcos. First, price cap regulation should not jeopardize the benefits small companies get from pooling. Of major importance to small rural telcos, are the mechanisms built into the mandatory carrier common line pool, which are designed to minimize incentives for geographical toll rate de-averaging. This pool enables high-cost companies to charge inter-exchange carriers <laughs> averaged rates for access to their networks. The averaged rate, in turn, lessens the pressures for bypass and preserves toll rate averaging. We question whether the long-term support mechanism in the pool, as developed in the Unity 1A agreement, can fulfill its functions in a price cap environment. If rates are not based on cost, as they are currently, <laughs> it is not clear how NECA should determine the average rate to be charged to long distance carriers. The Commission is aware that price caps could present a problem with respect to pooling mechanisms, but does not suggest a methodology to ensure continuation of long term support. Price cap regulation should not be implemented unless the Commission can ensure that it would not impede the effective operation of the CCL pool. Second, price cap regulation should not threaten toll rate averaging. The price cap plan as applied to AT&T may create pressure, if not incentives, to de-average. Under the price cap proposal, AT&T would be allowed to lower rates selectively as long as all rates were under the cap. AT&T could lower its rates in high-density areas and leave it them at the limit in low-density areas. Toll rate averaging is the cornerstone of universal service, for it promotes increased use of the telephone network by all subscribers, <coughs> including those in sparsely populated high-cost areas. If the price cap proposal causes AT&T to de-average toll, rural customers will have to pay significantly higher rates for long-distance telephone service. Price cap regulation should not undermine the universal service principles by encouraging de-averaging. The Commission must retain sufficient oversight of AT&T <coughs> to ensure that its rates remain geographically averaged. Third, 
the differences between large and small local exchange carriers are significant regulatory and economic factors that are key to the proposed price cap methodology affect small companies differently from larger ones large companies generally exhibit more predictable continuous trends and cost and demand than small companies for example a small cooperative may replace all of its central office switches in a few years or a major portion of its distribution plant at one time a big company is more likely to replace plant on a gradual and continual basis the difference between large and small companies is highly relevant to a determination of the adjustments to the price cap allowed under the proposal if all telcos are grouped together fluctuations and factors affecting small companies will be greater in degree or different in direction from large companies which will weight the average for example large company switching equipment may decrease in price driving the national indices down and triggering a decrease in the price cap of some or all services however at the same time the cost of similar equipment for small companies could increase small telcos could thus be faced with increased cost and decreased revenue simultaneously because of the significant differences between large and small companies NTCA believes the Commission should separately examine the impact of price cap regulation on small companies NTCA recognizes that it is appropriate for the Commission to examine other alternatives to rate of return regulation however price cap regulation would be a dramatic change therefore we strongly recommend the Commission carefully consider the impact of price caps on small companies both before proceeding further thank you mr chairman for the opportunity to present these comments i'll be happy to answer any questions fine thank you mr wilson the chair recognize uh, mrs swartz thank you mr chairman i appreciate very much your warm welcome and the opportunity to be here today to discuss both the pro proposed price cap regulation and some of the cost allocation uh, issues that it raises I should say at the outset that I do have a rather lengthy written submission which I'd like made part of the record without objection and if you'd like to summarize it feel free to do so and we'll put your statement in the record thank you mr. chairman and also that I am here essentially wearing two hats not only do I represent the New York State Public Service Commission but I was asked to speak on behalf of the National Association of State regulatory commissioners of regulatory utility commissioners excuse me I misspoke not state state and federal Fine. the proposed FCC price cap regulation on AT&T as a substitute for cost of service rate of return regulation is too much and too soon it is too drastic a change based on too little knowledge of the impact of that change although cost of service rate of return regulation is not perfect the FCC has overstated the alleged benefits of price cap regulation as a substitute. The shortcomings of a pure price cap approach are apparent in a comparison of AT&T's actual interstate rates and the rates that would have been authorized during the same time period had they been inflated each year by the CPI. And you can see that, Mr. Chairman, on pages 19 and 19A of my written testimony. Furthermore, cutbacks in FCC cost allocation compliance audits, which are justified by the FCC on the grounds that price cap regulation for interstate regulated services will itself preclude cross-subsidization, open the door to wanton exploitation of telephone service ratepayers. By reneging on its oversight responsibilities, the FCC turns a blind eye to the carrier's ability to subsidize unregulated services through overcharges for regulated services. Our realistic assessment leads us to conclude that a hybrid form of cost of service regulation is a more suitable approach than that proposed by the FCC. This is a form of incentive regulation exemplified in the New York Telephone Company rate moratorium. Implemented by the New York Public Service Commission in 1986, and extended this year this approach remains rooted in the cost of service philosophy but it shares productivity savings technologically induced cost savings 
and sales-based earnings between ratepayers and customers. Changes in rates are based on specific cost changes, and a rate of return cap is applicable to company earnings by flowing back 50% of any return in excess of 14% to the customers. This approach is, in my judgment, superior to a pure or indexed price cap. A modified price cap scheme, which I am referring to as an incentive approach, should be established for AT&T by the FCC on an experimental basis, and it should be closely monitored. The scheme should include adequate safeguards against cross-subsidies, including a well-audited cost allocation system. States whose consumer interests and regulatory responsibilities will be materially affected by any changes in the FCC regulatory approach should have a major role in determining the nature of the monitoring system. Any regulatory experiment should provide for reconsideration in the event that pre-established, strictly monitored quality of service standards are not met. This is the only way to retain the fairness to consumers that regulatory responsibility demands. And finally, we think that it is a very important aspect of any proposed change to consider the methods of cost allocation and the audits thereof. And we would like to reiterate in this forum a proposal that the states formally made to the FCC, which the FCC has rejected, to constitute a joint board with the states to establish cooperative methods of cost allocation audits. Unless state agencies have the time and expertise to correct for any misallocations by the FCC, captive local service ratepayers will be at risk of paying for some costs incurred for the provision of unregulated interstate services. And it will be impossible to know without thorough audits if this is occurring and to what extent. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Forrest. Chairman Hoffman recognize you at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here today representing the Competitive Telecommunications Association, or Comtel, <coughs> which is an association located here in Washington that represents over 100 long-distance telephone competitors. I'm currently chairman of the association. Our, our association has represented competitive interest on regulatory and legislative issues in Washington, D.C. for over six years. Our members have heavily invested in the future of competition. We are committed to a competitive marketplace, and that's why we're concerned about the FCC's price cap proposal. Rate of return regulation has certainly had its shortcomings, but it, it, has, it has also produced some benefits for consumers. Before any new scheme is adopted, Comptel believes that the FCC must assure that the public will be better served, in particular that consumers will be protected against the abuses of monopoly power. Comptel has identified a number of specific areas of concern which we believe must be addressed before pricing flexibility can be substituted for traditional rate of return regulation. First, AT&T's continued market dominance and its corresponding ability to cross-subsidize among its various services must be recognized. This ability allows AT&T to injure competition with predatory prices, which price caps alone cannot prevent. Thus, Comptel believes that price floors, as well as price caps, are necessary to prevent competitive abuses. In particular, we suggest a system of banded pricing for all of AT&T services on a rate element by rate element basis. This is not a new concept. It is the most common approach adopted by states that have given AT&T <coughs> significant pricing flexibility. Indeed, AT&T itself has proposed price banding in a number of states, most recently in California. Secondly, price bans must be structured so that AT&T cannot circumvent enforcement by labeling a service offering as new. In that regard, we believe the Achilles heel of the FCC's proposal is that it may not apply to so-called new services, which is an enormous loophole, considering that there is no such thing as a new service. All services are a variation of either switched or dedicated services or both. 
a t and t should not be permitted to avoid regulation by manipulating service definitions finally comp tell draws a clear distinction between a t and t in the local exchange carriers when it comes to the application of regulatory flexibility the fact is that local exchange carriers face virtually no competition for their regulated services thus flexibility could give rise to monopoly abuse particularly the particularly they could discriminate in the availability and price of access thus comp tell opposes the application of price caps or preferably price bans to local exchange carriers for these reasons comp tell welcomes this subcommittee's investigation of the f c c s proposal and urges you to continue to continue to remain actively involved in the development of alternate forms of regulation thank you very much thank you mr hoffman and recognize mr graham thank you very much mr chairman uh, i appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss the f c c s price cap proposal the office of people's council of maryland is a independent agency of the state of maryland <clears throat> required by law to represent the interests of residential and non commercial consumers of regulated utility services and that's the capacity in which i appear it's our view that the f c c proposal as now outlined is essentially a solution in search of a problem uh... we endorse uh, the testimony provided both before the f c c and here of the uh, CFA, which suggests that rate of return regulations record is substantially better than some would suggest that, in fact, a substantial and successful uh, telecommunication system <coughs> has been created uh, under this particular regime. Uh, that type of regulation, rate of return regulation, is designed to prevent the excess of monopoly, the, the exercise of monopoly power. It does this by simply tying rates to cost allowing for a reasonable return above those costs. Uh, the FCC proposal would abandon regulation of profit and replace it with regulation simply of rate or price, which I suspect falls prey to the uh, logical flaw, the, logical, the illogical perception that rates merely because they are stable or merely because they are going down are therefore just and reasonable. This is not correct. While the public may be happy and satisfied as long as rates are going down, the public, in fact, has a right to the benefit of cost reductions inherent in the system, as discussed earlier and demonstrated by the chart on my left. They have a right to have these pass through <coughs> to them as they develop. Uh, there is no reason why AT&T should be able to maintain and retain profits which result from the development of the system as it now exists. It is particularly ironic that the timing of this proposal would arise now when the benefits of these cost reductions are available to the people who in fact paid for them. Uh, one of the reasons I came here today was to discuss something that's already been discussed here today, which is the experience in Maryland, one of the states which has dealt with relaxed regulation. In Maryland, uh, AT&T of Maryland, which provides interlata long distance service in Maryland, came before the Maryland Public Service Commission. They argue that they were faced in the new world of telecommunications with the threat of competition. They argue that this competition could destabilize, cause problems with their earnings. They argue that this competition could prevent companies such as AT&T from earning excessive returns. They argue that regulation was not necessary to serve that purpose. And they argue that without the flexibility they needed, uh, they'd be unable to bring the benefits of uh, telecommunications to the citizens of Maryland uh, and to take advantage of uh, uh, innovations and new efficiencies provide them to the citizens of Maryland. Uh, in fact, under the system which the Maryland Public Service Commission inaugurated, a form of regulation they define as relaxed regulation, AT&T in 1985 earned 67 percent on rate base. In 1986, they earned 91 percent on rate base. Those figures continue basically on the same level up to today. It is unquestionably true that substantial reductions in rates have been enjoyed by, uh, by uh, consumers of AT&T in Maryland. While that is good, that is desirable, that is not the point. Had traditional rate of return regulation remained in effect, AT&T would have earned in the two years mentioned $13 million less than they have now earned. That's money that would have remained in the pockets of rate payers rather than in the treasury of AT&T. Uh, I want to respond briefly to a comment made in an earlier question. While it is true that AT&T's earnings are subject to volatility, that is, they can fluctuate, 
uh, because their rate base is small, uh, the volatility, in fact, has all been up and not down. In fact, if volatility due to a small rate base were the only problem, what you would see would be volatile earnings bouncing back and forth around a reasonable rate of return, which would result overall in the long haul in a reasonable return to the company. The volatility has not ever approached a reasonable rate of return. In fact, their returns have continued to be excessive. Indeed, the reductions we have seen in Maryland, despite AT&T's claims, were not the result uh, of competition. These reductions have consistently come when AT&T has been required to file its returns at the Maryland Public Service Commission. They have been the response by AT&T to the filing of embarrassingly high returns within the state of Maryland. These returns have never been sufficient to reduce AT&T's earned return down to the approximately 12% level where it was set prior to the experiments within the undertaken by the Maryland Public Service Commission. I want to make one point finally. We are not opposed to other approaches to regulation in our comments before the FCC. We have discussed various alternatives, some not dissimilar to what those which were discussed by uh, Ms. Schwartz, Commissioner from the uh, New York Public Service Commission here today. However, we do not think currently the case has been made uh, for the form of regulation proposed by the FCC. We do not think the public should be deprived of the opportunity to obtain the benefits of efficiency, which apparently are now about and have been up until now brought to them. We simply don't think that a system similar to, the, similar to that proposed by the FCC can in fact be designed in an administratively efficient way that will bring the benefits the FCC would like to see in administrative efficiency and still protect the public. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Glenn. The Maryland experience with the price cap approach has been the subject of a great deal of uh, discussion. Uh, That's correct, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Ms. Schwartz, there's been a lot of discussion about the experience states have had with the price cap uh, regulation. Can you tell us about the experience in New York? You have uh, yes, some I'm words on that. To. The first thing I'd like to say, Mr. Chairman, is that the legislature was not involved in our experiment, <coughs> uh, as was suggested earlier. Um, by one of the other uh, witnesses here. This was an initiative of the Public Service Commission. Um, the reason the legislature wasn't involved is because we have very permissive enabling legislation in New York State, which essentially gives us very broad discretion. And we have tried, in my, certainly in my tenure, and I'm sure before, to exercise uh, creativity uh, using that discretion. The basic idea uh, of the moratorium was, as I said before, to uh, encourage the company to affect efficiencies by allowing them to keep the savings. And that deals with the, the main drawback of cost of service rate of return regulation. That is a company that does become more efficient uh, under the traditional pure form of regulation can't keep those savings. And uh, the other aspect of it was not to abandon the responsibility to make sure that the rates charged were somehow uh, as closely as we could ascertain related to their co the cost of the services. So it's important to emphasize that the staff of the New York PSC very <laughs> thoroughly and very carefully reviewed the costs before we entered into this moratorium agreement in the first instance. Um, Having had one year of experimentation with it, we were then faced with a golden opportunity, so to speak, and that uh, is the result of what this Congress did. Uh, the Tax Reform Act of 1986 made available uh, what we jokingly referred to as a large pot of gold, uh, taxes that the company had collected but was not obliged to pay. And therefore, uh, it was possible to extend the moratorium agreement by permitting the company to keep some of those tax savings and to uh, refund part of them to the ratepayers. So this is an opportunity which we seized upon because it enabled us to reduce rates in 1987 and then stabilize them until 1990. And uh, the company benefited by the, the uh, faster acceleration of depreciation on certain capital equipment that had already put into place, which will also benefit the consumers in the future. 
uh, because that capital investment will no longer be in the rate base. And I guess uh, the most important aspect of all of this is that the state regulatory uh, officials, and particularly the staff that works very closely with the company, is in a position to know how these trade-offs can be worked out. And it takes a lot of time and effort to be in that position. I seriously question whether the FCC, with all the best intent in the world, is in that position, whether it knows the company it regulates half as well as our staff knows the companies that we regulate. And that's one of my main concerns with the whole approach of price cap regulation. I do not think that there is sufficient competition uh, to abandon the notion of regulation at all. And therefore, the next question is, how can you modify the regulatory scheme in such a way that the regulatory agency is still fulfilling its statutory responsibilities? That's why we think our approach is a better model than that which the FCC has put before us. Well, thank you. I'm glad to finally find someone that likes a, what I consider the lousy tax reform act. I'm <laughs> glad to see that it helps someone. Uh, I think, Mr. Hoffman, uh, you might discuss uh, the facts with regard to CompTEL's uh, members uh, being able to take away a, a portion, whether it's substantial or otherwise, of AT&T's revenues in the business segment of the market. To part, I think, uh, that is most frequently referred to as competitive. Uh, uh, some of the justification that's been used by the Commission to go forward with this proposal is, is that uh, the business market is heavily competitive. And, and I think the facts show that that is developing, but it's certainly not true yet. <coughs> some of the numbers that, that we have developed uh, based on, on uh, numbers developed for figures developed by the Commerce Department and, and in fact, uh, as a result of the tariffs filed by some of the carriers, lead us to conclude that AT&T still has about 80 percent of the market, of the business market. It uh, has somewhat less than that, uh, although not much less than that of the total market. Uh, of the remaining 20 percent, it appears as though CompTEL members have between 10 and 11 percent and MCI has 8 or 9 percent. So I, the point really is what I tried to make in my earlier statement is that uh, the market dominance of AT&T is clearly continuing and, and for that reason we're urging the commission and urging this committee, subcommittee, to proceed cautiously. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I might j just elaborate a little bit on, on that same issue because it came up in an earlier panel uh, about what the motivation is for members of CompTEL, other competitive carriers, to uh, to support this proposal, that, that somehow we're acting greedy because we'd like to see the price umbrella go up. And, and just to, there's been a, lo a lot of misunderstanding on that issue, particularly in this town, and I'd just like to take a half a minute and clarify it for the record. And, and the way I'd clarify it would be <coughs> to, to describe to you the fact that, that uh, eight out of ten of CompTEL's members are now operating profitably in the marketplace, and they, they are not expressing an interest in this proceeding because they want higher rates in order to become profitable because they're already profitable. And the other 15 or 20 percent of CompTEL members that, that uh, are not profitable are not profitable uh, as a result of the level of current rates. They're not profitable because they're investing millions and in some cases billions of dollars in constructing networks. And, and if it was simply a rate matter that would change their profitability, their rates would have to go up much more than, than is the promise uh, in this proceeding. And I, I thank you for the opportunity to put that in the record. And I thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilson, you seem to be very capable and able to answer the question that I'm, I'm about to uh, put to you. Uh, you represent uh, a small rural co-op out there, and, and I understood you say you represent the National Association too That's here. Right, sir. Uh, what do you think the impact of price cap regulation is the, is the same for small companies as it is on uh, big companies, large companies? I think the main focus we're trying to uh, point out is uh, as the 
uh, Chairman Patrick this morning alluded to the why factor, the unknown factors, uh, and since we don't know those, uh, it's hard to say that those impacts would be the same. I think primarily our thrust is let's be sure that it's not going to uh, detrimentally affect uh, the small companies uh, while we're trying to make the, the large companies more efficient. Do you ever hear people, particularly in the rural areas, say we just wish we had it back like it was? Uh, very often, sir. And do you feel that uh, we really, uh, what, what, are the, what are the facts with regard to actual cost, whether it's cheaper now uh, or, or that it's more expensive? Uh, our telephone service is much more efficient in rural areas than it has ever been before. But for basically, uh, let, let's stop and remember there would not be a cooperative system uh, if it weren't high cost because someone would have done it. Uh, while the larger companies were putting service in metropolitan areas, they weren't really worrying about the people out in the country that couldn't talk to each other. And uh, your predecessors in Congress are the ones whom we need to thank for the opportunity uh, to create our own telephone system, which we have done, uh, and we have done well. Uh, our, our people are now enjoying communications because of, uh, be because of these efforts. Uh, we consider ourselves a part of the tele telecommunications industry family. Uh, we're not here to, to say we are against progress because basically we are uh, innovative and have had to have been innovative to survive. Uh, we're not saying this is a bad idea. Uh, we're saying it may have some merits. But let's say... Uh, Just hope it can be administered. Hope it's economical. Well, let's say, let, let, let's go slowly. Let's, let's be sure we've done our study correctly before we implement something that is a uh, monster and then come in and start trying to correct uh, some mistakes that we could have uh, taken care of with, with, a, with a good study. Uh, in, in our... In the, file testimony that we submitted, we asked that a study be conducted concerning small companies by the FCC, uh, which previously had been indicated by the chairman or guaranteed to this committee that would be done, and we understand now that uh, probably will not. Uh, Mr. White, would, uh, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I must state that I am a rancher. I am not a telephone man. I put on a telephone hat once a month. Uh, uh, for some people who uh, do not understand the cooperative system, that may sound uh, I think it unique. Uh, but I would like to have uh, my CEO or manager, the man in our uh, association that works with it every day, if he has something to add in the response, I'd certainly I like to give him the opportunity to do I think it should be said that while a something. lot of other members of Congress uh, laid the legislative framework and groundwork, that it's people like you, though, that give you time and cared enough to uh, sit on long board meetings and take the time from your ranch and uh, then folks like each of the five of you who care enough to come and give your your time and your advice and your experiences to to this congress to improve and upgrade and to set in judgment somewhat on uh, the old theory of be not the first by whom the new is tried nor yet the last to lay the old aside and i think that's kind of what you're saying Mr. White, we recognize you for two minutes, and one minute's already gone. You want to <laughs> go ahead? <coughs> uh, one thing that I might add to what Jim had indicated is that what we were alluded, what he was talking about as far as this study, was a, uh, <coughs> a rate flex study that uh, I think uh, the former chairman Fowler had uh, promised to provide uh, to the Small Business uh, Administration Committee in regard to this, and this in this uh, particular instance has not been provided. I want to thank all of you. The, uh, Chairman Markey and other members of the committee have asked, uh, who, who are not here and could not be here, have asked for the right to submit written questions to members of this panel uh, to be entered in the record, if that's okay with you. And 
without objection it will be done and uh, on behalf of chairman markey and the subcommittee i thank you for your time your input and we are adjourned You've been watching a hearing on the regulation of telephone rates before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. To contact that panel, you may write to 316 House Annex 2, Washington, D.C. 20515. You'll get much more out of C-SPAN if you know when to watch and when to set your VCR. Your best general guide is our newspaper, the C-SPAN Update. It gives you the big picture on C-SPAN's programming week through its report.